everyone, and welcome to a brand new podcast called Rugrats View from the Crib. I'm your co-host, ZL. And I am your co-host, Patricia Miranda. Today, we're going to be dissecting the first season of Rugrats and see how it ca- see how the show came to be and how it ranks up with the rest of the seasons. Yes. And we'll be doing this, um, I would say we'll be doing this like maybe uh, once every month or every couple of months because there are a total of nine seasons and there's also the movies as well. And who knows, maybe we'll even tackle all grown up in preschool days in honor of the upcoming Rugrats reboot that's coming out next year. We've got a lot to go through. Unlike the other Nicktoons, Rugrats has had such a long run that that you could stack an entire library full of shows and movies and specials from the franchise. The only other show, the only other show you can do that with is SpongeBob and, and the Fairly Odd Parents. Oh yeah, those two. Uh, in terms of Nickelodeon shows, anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, Rio, you know, right before we discuss about the first season of Rugrats, so ZL, how did you first get introduced to Rugrats? I got introduced to it in the late nineties because. My dad was obsessed with cartoons. He'd always, always watch. He'd always, always watch them. I was, I was sent to them, but I wasn't really that aware of what was going on at the time. I'd, I'd watch whatever was on in the background, and he happened to love Rugrats because it had a, an accurate portrayal of a Jewish family, and he found it reliable that there was a. Um, a Jewish family that wasn't stereotypical portrayed in the show and I happened to get introduced to it because of that and I actually started finding it funny myself and I got hooked ever since. This was like 96 or 97. Yeah. Um, I first got introduced to it when it first aired back in 91. I was uh, very young and I remember the um, distinction of it being like really unique in a way that I had never seen before. A show about talking babies. That was kind of interesting. It came out around the same time as Ren and Stimpy and Doug and um, and, you know, I, I was more into, like, Ren and Stimpy at the time, but as time went on, like, as the, the, season, the, the further that the show came along, I got just as obsessed with Rugrats as I was with, you know, the likes of Ren and Stimpy and uh, Rocco's Modern Life and such. I think the thing that makes Rugrats rank up with them is that, despite the fact that it's a slice of life show, it has really weird, surreal, trippy, hypnagogic animation that really helps it stand out. And allows it to be cartoony while showing life how it really is, like a realistic portrayal, an accurate portrayal of life. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I you know, when when watching the first season again, I was reminded just how weird that the show can get. <laughs> I know. I mean, honestly, some of the animation sequences feel like a Bob Clampett fever dream. <laughs> yeah, they kind of do, don't they? It's like if, um, you know, I, I, I can, and you know, when I was a kid, I was like, just so weirded out with like, you know, characters, you know, being like weirdly drawn as like moons and planets and, you know, things that are small becoming giants. It was just like a real, it was really surreal. But at the same time, the adventure that the babies would go through was definitely something that kind of like, um, increased my imagination, which is why uh, I really did have a strong love for it. So I think that with that out of the way, yeah, so let's discuss about the history of Rugrats. So the show was created by Arlene Klasky, Gabor Chupo, and Paul Germain. Now, Klasky Chupo has had worked in other things uh, in the animation uh, business. Uh, you might know them as working on the first couple of seasons of The Simpsons and other projects. So, you know, Rugrats was like kind of their first show that really brought them into the mainstream. And throughout the 90s and 2000s, they had produced or created some of the most memorable cartoons, uh, not only in Nickelodeon, but for a lot of other um you know channels and venues uh, you may know them for duckman you may know them for stressed eric you may know them from those 
McDonald's, Ronald McDonald um, VHS tapes that they used to give away. Santo Boguito is another one. Santo Boguito is so underrated. It's a very obscure show, that's for sure. It's, uh, but uh, here's a fun fact. Yeah, go ahead. Did you know that it was originally one of the shows that Klasky Chupo had in mind to pitch to Nickelodeon, but it was turned down. Yeah, there were a lot of uh, you know pilots that were pitched to Nickelodeon that never got picked up. Uh, we already talked about this many times when we were doing the Nickelodeon Slimecast podcast, but one, um, but yeah, one of them, uh, according to Vanessa Coffey, she said that there was originally supposed to be um, a Thanksgiving short alongside with Nick's Thanksgiving Fest about talking babies and their experiences with Thanksgiving, but it never came to be. And we wouldn't have that until much later on in the series where the babies knew about Thanksgiving and the, the turkey that came to dinner. So, um, yeah, so Arlene Klasky and Gabor Chupo, they kind of had the idea of Rugrats because they were themselves becoming new parents at the time. There was a TV show in the 80s called 30-something in which it's a bunch of 30-year-old people and they were experiencing their everyday lives. And so Arlene was like, you know, what would it be like if it was like a, a baby version of that? And then we had Paul Germain who kind of like brought in a lot of ideas into the series that we would know. He was the one that brought in the more adult jokes in terms of treating the babies a lot more seriously. He was the one who created the character of Angelica. And he was the one that throughout the first three seasons was the main showrunner of the entire run of Rugrats. He was basically to Rugrats what Sam Simon was to The Simpsons. Yeah, exactly. It was so basically, um, you know, it was Paul Germain that kind of like took the the leaps and bounds into making Rugrats of what we would know for the first three seasons, and he would also and and not to mention there were also a lot of writers whom we would come to know in TV shows such as Hey Arnold, Recess, and such who would become writers for Rugrats. And for the first episode, we have that example. So let's get into it. So the very first episode of Rugrats is called Tommy's First Birthday. It originally aired on August 11th, 1991, and it was written by Paul Germain and Craig Bartlett, who you may know is the creator of Hey Arnold. And in this episode, Stu and Dee Dee strive to make Tommy's first birthday a memorable one. They do, but under the wrong circumstances. Meanwhile, Tommy wants to eat dog food so he can be just like Spike, eventually selling the other Rugrats the idea. I actually thought it was a solid way to actually introduce the, the series. Do you know what actually stood out for me? Yeah, what? Although Angelica is introduced as an anti-hero slash antagonist, I love how... She's mostly constrained in that episode and shows off her nicer side and her willingness to join in with the group's activities instead, no, I mean like, instead of um, pulling tricks on them and pranking them or uh, <sighs> misleading them. Yeah, exactly. Angelica is a little bit more restrained than she would be a lot later on in the first three seasons. At first, she does kind of push Tommy around saying that uh, that when Tommy opens up his presents that she gets first dibs on the toys. But then when she hears the idea about dog food and the concept of being turned into a dog, she wants to use it so that she can be able to bite the mailman. Generally, I do think that she's a good person. I, the show does show that later on. It's just that given her circumstances, including her parents being workaholics, she has so much pent-up frustration that she takes it out on the babies out... Um, as a result of jealousy. I actually preferred the way Angelica was in the first three seasons because she actually gave the show conflict and obstacles for the babies to overcome. Yeah, I for like sure. her as a character in general, but I, I preferred her in much earlier seasons because she was out of me this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, Paul Germain, um, the, uh, the inspiration for Angelica was that it was based off of a bully that Paul Germain had when he was a kid. And uh, he decided that he thought that the show should have kind of like a little antagonist 
uh, which Arlene at first hated. There was an interview a few years before um, R- the Rugrats movie where she talked about how much she hated the character of Angelica. But then one of the writers, Steve Vixton, came along and said that Angelica was essentially the J.R. Irwin of Dallas of, of Rugrats. And we, we'll talk more about Steve Vixton because he'll write the second episode. But keep that in mind when it comes to Steve Vixton and Angelica because he would write some of the most memorable episodes of Angelica. He is a legend in these parts. Yeah. So one thing that I do have to say when looking at the first uh, season of Rugrats, especially with this first episode, I do admit that the animation is very rough. Uh, it wouldn't get like completely refined until like season two. So it does kind of like look a little awkward. Even the music, it, it is the iconic music that you would hear from the likes of Dennis M. Hannigan and Mark Mothersbaugh, but it is a little bit uh, choppy at times. And I, I- can... Okay. Oh, kind of like the roughness. I, I the roughness. I don't know why. It's just it just kind of gives the show an identity a little bit. I can understand that, especially with the later seasons on, where they try to clean it up a bit. That happens with most shows, though. Yeah, that's true. You know, you take what you can get. So. Okay, so in this episode, we actually do get first introduced to the other characters. We get introduced to Chucky, uh, we get introduced to Phil and Lil, and their parents, Howard and Betty, and we get introduced to, um, you know, the father, Drew, and we get introduced to Dee Dee's parents, Boris and Minka. Drew would forever become the YouTube poop king. He would spawn a generation of YouTube poops. Oh, well, I'm not too familiar with that, but you you got that right for sure. So basically, uh, the one thing that I really do appreciate, especially with this first episode, is that, um, you know, when, when I first watched Rugrats as a kid, I always generated towards the baby's perspective because I really just got into it. I, I guess I wasn't old enough to appreciate the adult's point of view. But now that I'm watching this, I actually do like the adult's point of view. We have Stu trying to build Tommy a really nice birthday present called the Hovorama, which if you were to look at it now would be like the equivalent of giving a baby like one of those glider planes, like those I electric think, uh... ones. I think Cheryl Chase said it best. It's a family show. Well, I think that's what made it work on both levels. First of all is the perspective of the babies and how they view the world, where they could be either pirates or judges or people out in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. Basically basically all of that. And then you have the adults, like much like the creators of the time, who are new parents and they're struggling with how to raise their kids and to get right so they're dependent on child psychologists and uh how to box yeah exactly so whenever that you see Dee Dee reading a children's book about how to raise a child properly or mentioning dr lipschitz it is actually a reference to dr spock now dr spock was very well known for being like the doctor of how to raise your kids by themselves for over a few decades his name was synonymous for how to properly raise your child. And they decided to poke fun of the fact that, you know, parents were relying so much about how to raise a child by books and about doctors that they didn't know how to do it naturally. So we have Dee Dee who's constantly panicking that things are not going as planned. The, the puppet show is not there in time and the guests are running a little bit late. So she's concerned about whether that she is a good mother. And that's actually pretty relatable in my opinion. And then we have Stu who's striving to build the perfect choice the perfect toy for Tommy, which if you were to look at it in hindsight is actually like really, really dangerous. And then, you know, we have the other characters who I feel that they wouldn't be fleshed out as much. Um, Like, for example, um, I think that like characters such as like Phil and Lil, uh, they, you know, they're kind of like really supportive, but they wouldn't be like their gross selves. Chucky is a little bit timid, but he does show a little bit of brave to him which does follow in the series but it's not as fleshed out as it would later on and um then you have you know uh howard and betty who um the the portrayal is actually pretty uh consistent with howard kind of being like being pushed over by betty but they're still not as developed as they would later on and then we have boris and minka who are the grandparents and you know they're the stereotypical grandparents who would always talk about the old country and about how things used to be which is pretty relatable in my opinion 
I think what makes Stu work as a character is that as a character is that he's not the typical Home Simpson Peter Griffin type dad, but he's actually he's actually a reasonably smart guy. He's just just everything goes up in smoke for him and his plans fail at best. Yeah. Which in my opinion is more realistic, grounded and relatable. Oh yeah, for sure. So, yeah, the episode is straightforward and simple. So we essentially just have these babies who are just trying to go after, you know, dog food so that they think that they can turn into dogs. The one thing that kind of, like, shocked me when rewatching the episode again was just the dramatic moment where Stu and Drew are trying to do a little Red Riding Hood. And they're constantly arguing with one another and bringing up some sad, repressed childhood memories. And they just start to cry. And I was like, wow. I mean, even, like, something that is supposed to be like really cheerful and happy it just ends up going up in smoke it was hilarious because because all of that just it, just to make Tommy's birthday memorable while Tommy isn't even focused on that he's focused on trying to get the dog food yeah exactly so the episode does end on a pretty nice note. So we have, you know, the babies do eventually eat the dog food. They don't turn into dogs, but they feel that they are when they start barking and then they they, they think they have fleas. And um, there's actually a really interesting question that uh, Casey and Ashley from the Friday Night Nicktoons podcast actually did a poll on. It's like, do you, do you believe that they are dogs or are they pretending to be dogs when they eat the dog food? And a lot of people think that they actually believe that they're dogs, which is great because it really goes into the imagination of a young child thinking that if they pretend to be something, they actually are that. That's what I think as well. I think they believe that they were dogs and that they they were starting to turn into dogs and that, and, uh, that parking was kind of like the first sign for them, for that. And then... The episode leaves the rest. Then leaves the rest of the imagination. Yeah, pretty at much. the end. Yeah. So that should be it for this episode. Now, um, ordinarily, uh, on where in between, you know, I usually like to give ranks on an episode, whether I find it like a yay, nay, or a meh. Uh, do you want to do a ranking, or do you want to just leave it at that? I think yay. Okay. Uh, it is a. It was a great introduction to what would otherwise become a really iconic and really well remembered and popular series that that only SpongeBob has been a, been able to kind of like dethrone dethrone it. Otherwise, behind SpongeBob, it's probably pretty much the most successful series Nickelodeon's had even to this day. Yeah. I, actually, I do give it a yay as well. It's a great introduction to the series. It introduces the characters pretty well, even though that some of them are not as flushed out as they would be later on. Very simple premise, but it's executed pretty well. And yeah, I do give it a yay as well. All right, so let's go over to our second episode, which is called Barbecue Story. It was released on August 18th, 1991, and it was written by Steve Vixen and Joe and Sullivan. In this episode... God bless Steve Vixen. Yes, God bless Steve Vixen. Uh, in this episode, Tommy has received his most favorite toy in the whole wide world, a ball. Angelica, who is looking to spoil the baby's fun, takes the ball and tosses it into the next yard, resulting in the babies risking life and limb to look for it. So we essentially have the adults having a little barbecue and, you know, Stu is cooking turkey burgers and everybody's just talking and having fun. And then we have Tommy showing off his brand new ball with Angelica throwing it into the other side because... You know, she wants to spoil their fun. Of course, she does. I think originally she comes off. She came off as a bully who wanted to make their lives miserable as a way as a way to show the audience that life is not fair and that bad things happen whether you like it or not, and that there are people who will give you a hard time. And I think that's what Angelica was originally supposed to be, and this episode fair, perfectly encapsulates that. Yeah, she's definitely a lot more mean here than in the previous episode, where she was a tad bit mean, but she was able to go along with the baby's journey of trying to get dog food. But here, she's just the antagonist, uh, the first antagonist in this episode. The second one would be the dog. 
So, yeah, this is the first time in the series in which we would have an adventure outside of the house. It would be, you know, them going from one yard to another. And then we have, um, you know, the basically like the first perspective of how huge everything is. From the fence to the grass to just normal everyday objects. Everything just looks giant in that, pr in that perspective. And, you know, we have Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil trying to get the ball. And then finding out that there is a giant dog that is guarding it. And this is actually one of uh, three cases in which I've seen this plot before in a Nicktoon at the time. There was one episode of Doug in which, um, you know, Patty gives Doug and Skeeter a toy, like a, like a frisbee that kind of makes like a weird noise. And it ends up in another yard with a crazy dog. There's a Ren and Stimpy episode in which, you know, Ren and Stimpy are really hungry and there's a plate of hog jowls sitting on a windowsill and they have to deal with a vicious baboon. So this plot that has was, been done before. The line was actually supposed to be a parody of pie pirates from Yogi Bear. That's right, exactly. So, yeah, this so this concept has been done before. And personally, I like the Ren and Stimpy one a little bit better than the other two. But I would say that this is the second best with the third best of Doug is actually kind of a cop out. But yeah, this one right here is actually pretty scary when you look at the dog. The dog is huge and vicious. And you would think, I mean, it would be scary enough for an adult to tackle, let alone a baby. I love how daring and edgy the first season really was in hindsight. And I loved how the camera and drawings really overemphasized and um, amplified certain objects and certain anim animals and, well, in general, showing how ba how the babies view things and how scary it can be. Yeah. Giving that perspective to the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and also this would be one of the first times in which Spike kind of plays a little major role in, especially when it comes to Tommy and his adventures, because he would be the one to save Tommy from being attacked by the giant dog. And uh, a lot of people like to theorize this. I, I believe that I even brought this up when I spoke to Paul Germain a few years ago. But there is a woman with red hair in the crowd that a lot of people assume is Chucky's mom. I it, he said that they threw little references by that in as kind of like a joke. But originally, they weren't supposed to talk about it because death was too taboo for a kids' network at the time. Both our lead and the network thought it was unacceptable. But a few years later, when it came back from the dead the first time, yeah, exactly. they decided to write in that Chucky's mom is dead. And... Mm -hmm. And, well, basically, that puts a damper on that. Yeah, even till, I think still to this day, Paul Germain kind of regretted that he wasn't able to tell his point of view about Chucky's mom. So, but, uh, yeah, we'll talk more about Chucky's mom when we reach over to the later seasons. So, yeah, th this is actually uh, an interesting point that a lot of people seem to overlook when it comes to the early seasons of Rugrats, about that. You know, the, the the inside jokes about Chucky's mom, because there's going to be a later episode down in the line where we'll, that Chucky does mention about his mom. So, yes, if you do, if you do watch the original uh, three seasons of Rugrats and you do catch that little reference, then just remember that it is an inside joke. It is not actually canon. It won't be canon until the revival run. So, yeah. The first so, revival run, anyway. <laughs> right. I guess we do need to call it that now because of the, the, the reboot series that's going to be happening next year. So, there you go. All right. So, yeah, there's not really a lot to say about this story. Um, you know, just it ends off with, you know, um, everybody celebrating a nice... Uh, is, is this supposed to be, like, 4th of July? Because I don't think they ever I think mentioned it. I think it's supposed to be. The, the writing gives off that impression. Yeah, and there's also fireworks at the end. So I I assume this is supposed to be 4th of July, even though they never mention it. All right, so yeah, it ends off really sweetly with, you know, Tommy and Spike together and them watching the fireworks. And um, not really much to say too much about the adult's perspective other than, you know, Stu cooking the tur turkey burgers and ending up burning them. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, you um, can't even cook burgers properly, come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, how would you rank this episode? I think it's good. Not the best Rugrats episode I've seen, but it gives a fairly detailed um, point of view of what 
an episode of a typical episode of Rugrats would turn out to be. Um, Tommy's first birthday was like kind of like a warm up, but this really, really shows you what the show is intended to be about. Yeah. I do agree as well. It, it is a yay, but definitely a much weaker yay than compared to uh, Tommy's first birthday. Even though that Tommy's first birthday was like the starting point, I felt that you know everything about the um, the, the story and and the the balance between focusing on the babies and the and the adults were a little bit more balanced in that episode as opposed to Barbecue Story, where it's mostly focused on the baby's point of view. But I do enjoy it. I do enjoy that the it's a lot more the the stakes are higher in this one dealing with a bigger dog as opposed to just getting dog food so i do have to give it that for sure all right so we go into episode 2a uh we go into episode 2b which is going to be the first case in which instead of having two um instead of having one episode that lasts for 24 minutes it'll be two episodes lasting for about 11 minutes so this one is called waiter there's a baby in my soup and it was written by craig bartlett and paul germain and in this episode, Stu and Dee Dee are, end up taking Tommy to an important dinner at Shea Wini with Mr. Mucklehoney, president of Mucklehoney Industries, a toy company, since Tiffany, the babysitter, and Grandpa have other plans. Tommy, however, has plans of his own. So in this episode, this is kind of like the first instance in which we see Tommy as a little bit more of a troublemaker because he starts making a little bit of a mess and he... Um, tends to like you know do things that we wouldn't see Tommy do in later seasons. In later seasons, Tommy is much more behaved. Angelica is supposed to be the one who's the troublemaker out the out the group. Yeah, exactly. And I think in this first season is where we see Tommy at his most destructive. We'll see an episode later on about him coloring the walls and, you know, pulling on Dee Dee's ear and making a mess of everything. I mean, a lot of people do actually like this version of Tommy because it depicts him as an actual baby. So make of that what you will. So um, I don't think I don't think he tends to do it. I just think that it's his baby instincts. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair for sure. So, yeah, we have, um, you know, Stu having to go over to an important dinner because he wants to pitch a whole bunch of toys to his boss, Mr. Mucklehoney, who runs a toy company, which I, I, I didn't even know that Stu actually worked for a toy company and building a whole bunch of toys. In later seasons, I assumed that he was actually a freelance toy maker, but no, he actually works for a company. I actually thought he owned his own company. Does he... Does he do, like, both or something? I don't know. Maybe he does do both because um, this isn't the first time that we'll be, you know, listening. Dollars income. Yeah, maybe. Exactly. I, I was actually, uh, you know, there was an episode later down the line where we talk about Stu's income. But I think that in this version, I think that maybe he does in the beginning of the first season that he does have um, a job working in a toy company who, designing toys for children right before he kind of goes on to his own, which it does make a lot of sense if you think about it. Can't deduct them if you don't have any income. <laughs> right, exactly. So yeah, we have, um, you know, Stu and Dee Dee having to deal with the situation that, you know, they can't have Tommy, you know, being babysat by anyone. Uh, you know, Grandpa Lou is off in bowling, the babysitter, her, you know, pet goldfish died, and so they have to take Tommy to the restaurant. And this is definitely at the point in which things start to get, like, really crazy. So Tommy sneaks into the, the kitchen and messes up with a whole bunch of things, and, you know, he causes a lot of mayhem like putting cayenne pepper and Tabasco sauce in soup and putting forks and knives into a pie and getting himself inside the spaghetti dish. And, you know, then we have Stu being incredibly nervous about presenting his toys to Mr. Mucklehoney because these are all toys that he's seen before. But Mr. Mucklehoney is like laughing it out, thinking that it's a joke. Just the mayhem, Tommy. Get it. The mayhem and Mr. Tommy gets into in that episode is not only realistic for a baby, but it's actually hilarious. Yeah, exactly. Like, what are all the crazy things that you would do inside of a restaurant? And this wouldn't be the first time in which, you know, the babies will be involved with mayhem outside of the house. We'll talk more about that in the next episode. But... 
here, I think that the destruction that Tommy does is actually pretty shocking. Like, you know, basically, like, causing severe damage to a whole bunch of people if they eat their food. And then we have, um, you know, Mr. Mucklehoney eating the soup because, um, you know, that was what he ordered. And then being... And then choking because it's incredibly hot. It kind of reminds me of that scene in Mrs. Doubtfire in which Stu actually eats, you know, the the shrimp and he starts choking because of the cayenne pepper because he's allergic to it. I'm actually curious about if maybe that's a reference to it. Me too. Yeah, and so Stu tries to help Mr. Muckle Honey, but he can't because his shoes were tied into the pole of the table that Tommy did. And Mr. Muckle Honey, his um, his shoes were tied together with with bubble gum, and so the table falls on him. And then instead of Mr. Muckle Honey being angry about this, he's actually laughing it off, and he gives Stu a raise and saying that he'll accept all of his toys and such. And that's pretty much it. It's just crazy mayhem and hilarity. I love how it pretty much goes kind of blends with the with the um, with the chaos and destruction that Tommy gets into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that this is a much more better episode than Barbecue Story. At least with Barbecue Story, uh, I did enjoy the risks that it took in terms of you know Tommy trying to get his ball from a dog. But this one I think is a lot more hilarious, and it also has a great um, you know side story with Stu and Mr. Mucklehoney. I thought that Mr. Mucklehoney was really hilarious, and it does give a little bit of um, dramatic twist with Mr. Mucklehoney choking when he eats the the hot soup. So I actually did enjoy this episode. Me too. I mean, I liked it better than the first installment. Mm-hmm. All right, then. Let's go over to our next episode. So, episode 3A, we have At the Movies. It was uh, released on August 25th, 1991, and it was written by Craig Bartlett and Paul Germain. They actually, they both co-wrote a lot of the episodes for the first season. They did, yes. Uh, in this episode, Tommy wants to see Reptar, but his parents take him and the other Rugrats to the West Side Octoplex to see The Land Without Smiles, starring the Dummy Bears. The Rugrats leave the Dummy Bears to go look for Reptar, showing at the same theater, leaving a path of destruction behind him. So we have two introductions in this episode. Well, technically three. So we have the introduction of Reptar, which will become a very iconic part of the show. We have the Dummy Bears, which is a show that the the babies eventually do, you know, invest themselves into, especially with the introduction of the Carmichaels. And then we have the introductions to Larry and Steve, who um, are these like bumbling, you know, teenagers who constantly go from job to job and, you know, they constantly argue with one another. Kind of like a Bill and Ted uh, waiting guy. Uh... Cheech and Chung, Harold and Kumar, James are about kind of deal. Like, they, these, uh, like, those types of slackers. Yeah, exactly. So they're the, they are the stereotypical teenage slackers who just work at the movie theater and uh, just constantly argue with one another. So, yes, this is our first introduction of Reptar. And, you know, Tommy is immersed with it. And he wants to go see the movie. And... Uh, you know, then it, then it turns out that they have to go see another movie, which is the Dummy Bears movie, Land Without Smiles. And obviously, the Dummy Bears is based off of the Care Bears because the Care Bears during the nineties, uh, during the eighties, was like one of the most popular things on children's television. Believe it or not, the Care Bears movie actually made a lot more money in its theatrical run than the Black Cauldron. Wow. Yeah. I love how Rugrats basically destroyed how Saccharin and Cubesy the Care Bears are. Because yeah. Rugrats itself was supposed to be the antithesis of what kids programming was in the 80s, in that, it was, in that it's supposed to treat kids as intelligent human beings and provide them with smart stories and um, character-driven plots. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's very smart, too. It was essentially just making fun of all of the pandering and childish cartoons that they would be showing to kids at the time that was focusing more on toys and merchandise. And there's also another um, ref. It, it also kind of reminds me of the of Garfield and Friends, in which um, there was a group of bears known as the Buddy Bears who are just constantly happy and constantly singing like happy songs so that 
they can be able to teach kids life lessons. And it was basically made fun of saying that, you know, kids are smarter than this and that they don't need some happy bears to show them how life works. So, you know, Grandpa Lou is basically, you know, uh, a lot of people in that sense of, you know, this is dumb and this is pandering to children and he's not interested in watching it. But they, uh, but you know, the rest of the, uh, you know, but Stu and Dee Dee want to take the babies along as this was going to be their very first movie experience. And um, it's actually hilarious to see Grandpa Lou kind of turn things around when, um, you know, he's invested in this movie, especially when we have that sad scene where one of the dummy bears is apparently dying. I think that's what was hilarious, of, what was hilarious about the episode is that they went through all the trouble to endure a, mo endure a movie that they didn't even want to see just for the babies. And yet, the babies weren't even interested in it. They were more interested in the Raptor movie. Yeah, exactly. So, just like uh, Waiter, There's a Baby in My Soup, Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil just cause a whole bunch of mayhem. They, you know, they basically, like, mess up with the soda machine and there's soda everywhere. The, the popcorn is being spilled over. The candy bars are being eaten. And they basically just leave a mess everywhere. And then they mess up with the movie projectors because they don't know which one is Reptar. And they just play around with it. Like if it's a bunch of string and, um, you know, ropes that you play in like a jamboree or something. And so then we have everybody... You're talking to me? No, I was talking to Tommy. Let's try another one. <laughs> yeah, did, yeah. Did you know that Gabar Chupo uploaded a video of his daughter doing a reenaction of Taxi Driver. Oh, I didn't Speaking know that. That's actually pretty cool. It made me think of this episode. <laughs> That's really neat. Yeah, so we have a Taxi Driver reference, and, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other references, too. Like, uh, there's this, like, this romantic movie with a, you know, with a couple kissing each other. And then they were, like, not even remotely interested whatsoever. And then they, they do find Reptar, but, you know, because of them playing around with the movie projectors, the entire film is destroyed, and all of the... Uh, people who went to go see the movies were just incredibly disappointed, especially at the end of, you know, the Dummy Bears movie where we were going to find out about if, you know, the, that Dummy Bear who was dying pulled through, but they never got to see it. And so then they decided, you know, let's just go, let's go see another movie next weekend. So that's basically it. So um, overall, um, it's actually really nice to see a, a perspective like going to the movies with the perspectiveness of babies. Like, what would they do? They would try to go in from movie theater to movie theater. They would mess up with the concession stand. They would go up to the projector booth and they would just mess up with everything. So it does give in a whole bunch of tragedy, not only just for some of the vendors at the restaurant that we saw in the last episode, but for pretty much everybody who's in that uh, movie theater being incredibly unsatisfied with everything. Uh, but the important thing is they got the zay rack power at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I really enjoyed this episode a lot. I thought it was very funny. And I thought that, you know, the progression of the babies, you know, trying to have their little adventure of trying to see the Reptar movie was really fun. And, um, you know, seeing Grandpa Lou progressing from not being remotely interested to being totally invested was actually pretty funny. And yeah, I actually... It's also very ironic. Yes. I, I, I really like this episode. Me too. I actually think that was one of the best episodes of the first season. Oh, yeah, for sure. And really would showcase how the show would eventually flesh itself out to be much later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss about our personal favorite episodes of the first season as soon as we're done covering all these episodes. So, yeah, let's go over to our next episode, which is Slumber Party. This episode was written by Jeffrey Townsend. And in this episode, Angelica stays up... There's a close friend of Paul. Yes. In this episode, Angelica stays over with Tommy, but her desire for an open window leaves Tommy feeling ill and hallucinating, which eventually leads to his vomiting on her. Now, I don't know how a lot of people feel about this episode, but I'm not too crazy about this one. I actually kind of lied to myself. I liked how it showed a nice and more sentimental side of Tommy and Angelica's relationship as cousins and show, I mean, like, particularly drawing, the, I mean, towards the end and shows that despite 
Alan Jeff may behave, she does deep down, in all sincerity, care about him. Uh, well, I, the reason why I say that is because I think that the first half starts off pretty slow. It starts off with, um, you know, Tommy playing with his toys as always, and then Angelica comes over excited about her first slumber party. And then Tommy's, like, confused about, like, you know, what's a slumber party? And then she's like, you know, if you'll ask, you'll never know, which is very vague. And Tommy himself doesn't, like, fully understand it. Now, instead of, like, a usual slumber party in which, like, you know, um, you would do, like, a whole bunch of fun things, like... Um, you know, maybe, like, play some games or tell some stories or something like that, immediately it goes for them, you know, going, to, you know, for a nap. And I, I feel like this episode could have been a little bit better had maybe, you know, Chucky, Phil, and Lil had been there. I like the music that plays when Tommy goes to sleep and Angelica's awake. It, I mean, like, Angelica opens the window and then she gets to call because it actually, I think it moves the scene along in a very, very beautiful and, um, Point of manner. I mean, I think a lot, a lot of, I think what drives a lot of the emotion in Rugrats is definitely the music. That's fair, and the music is pretty decent in this episode. I do admit, but um, I actually like the second half a lot better when Tommy starts hallucinating when he gets sick from the window being opened. It really picks up. From it that. does. It really does pick up from here. It that's when it just goes like, okay, logic. Who are you? Get out of here. So Tommy imagines that you know Stu and Dee Dee are planets, and you know then we have Grandpa Lou coming along, and then Angelica is like a cupid, and. You know, they're trying to find ways for Tommy to feel better and for him to go to sleep. And, um, yeah, it's just really weird. Like, like it's the kind of... It's, like, so trippy. I, I, it, it's really relatable because when you're sick and when you're, like, taking medicine, you're not fully yourself and you can't comprehend on what's going on. You know, sometimes even when you're taking a nap and, um, you know, things are... You have, like, these crazy, like, fever dreams and you kind of, like, wonder about if it's really happening or not. It's... This moment is, like, really relatable. I remember when I was sick a few months ago with, like, one of the worst colds I've ever went through. And I just had the weirdest dream ever. I can't really explain it, but it was, like, something that I couldn't, like come up with myself if I was not sick so that moment right there was like really relatable and it's actually pretty hilarious to see that trippiness that Klasky Chupo could do really well that's their trademark and I think that's why they're one of my favorite animation companies yeah in fact it, my favorite animation company of well the modern era anyway yeah sure I think that the comeuppance that um, Angelica gets in the end where Tommy throws up at her is actually pretty satisfying and pretty hilarious, saying, like, yeah, this is actually what you deserve, Angelica. I'm sorry. And then, you know, Tommy starts feeling a little bit better, and then, you know, and, you know, then the episode pretty much ends with Tommy asking Angelica about what's a slumber party, and then she basically just says the, the same thing. It's like, if you ask, you'll never know. And, you know, they, it just leaves it at that. And like I said earlier, I mean, I, I'm, when it compared to other episodes in the first season, this one is not one of my favorites. It starts off a little bit slow at first, and then it starts picking up in the second half. So I'm just going to say that this episode's okay. I think what makes Angelica work as a character, like characters like D.W. or K. Lou, is that when she's at her worst, she isn't a character you're supposed to support a uh, root for us in general because I think that general, generally you are supposed to feel sorry for her and she is a good person deep down but whenever she does something does something with malicious intent like here it's always written in a way where you're not exactly supposed to cheer her on and she does get and she does always get a comeback, and she's always get she always gets punished for her actions, unlike the other characters who are basically seen as morally right, especially Kalu. I feel like Angelica has more character, and more death, and she's not irritating like they are. All right, then let's go over to our next episode, episode four, which aired on September eighth, nineteen ninety one. 
4A is Baby Commercial, written by Steve Vixen and Joan Sullivan. In this episode, Phil and Lil make a brief appearance in a diaper commercial, and they tell Tommy about it, as well as the mayhem they cause in the process. So now we have a Phil and Lil-centric episode, which I believe is the very first one that they've ever had, where Tommy's not really like the main focus of the episode. Tommy's just listening to the um to the story that Phil and Lil went through in terms of you know them going to film a baby commercial about diapers. Up until season three, there was actually a directly there's a direct policy in which every episode has to include Tommy in it in some form. Uh, for the previous episode we were talking about, I'd give it a decent. I mean, it's not great, it's not perfect, but it does it does exhibit how Tommy and Delica's relationship is really, really well Mm -hmm. and for this episode i actually i actually thought it was decent and gave another perspective gave a whole new perspective in the film world's personalities in the sense that they actually do have baby-like characteristics and like babies in real life they cause they cause damage they cause mayhem they they wreak havoc a lot of first uh, first season episodes were wreak havoc episodes yeah, exactly. So we have another case in which there is havoc and mayhem. So Phil and Lil are invited over to this TV studio to film a baby commercial. And we have this director who is like incredibly like passionate about this baby commercial. He sees the diaper pyramid and he says, I saw this from a dream and it's amazing. And um, then we have him showing off like how to, you know, crawl into the diaper pyramid and... It's apparently like you crawl there, you look at the camera, and you wink, and then you crawl out. You're expecting babies to do that? (laughs) I know. I mean, like, does he view babies in the same way that he views adults? Yeah, I think he does. I think he really does. (laughs) And here's the thing. This is really relatable to me now because I'm going to school for um, audio and video production. So I've done a lot of projects at this point where I would be behind a camera and film things like concerts and um, seminars and stuff like that. And filming a commercial was actually one of my homework assignments. And it's not easy, you know, filming and editing and producing anything because you have to play around with the fact that there's going to be some cases where you have to do multiple takes, you have to check for sound, and you have to make sure that you edit everything down to exactly a certain amount of time because that's what you're paid to do. And for a commercial, it's like 30 seconds at the most. And what he was giving off in a sense of what he was doing was like less than 10 or 15 seconds as we saw in the final product of the commercial of what it looked like so yeah it's like you know crazy to think about that you know that i'm actually doing something right now in getting into the media business and i'm actually seeing it firsthand i actually did apply for a media college back in 2013 and i did spend like a month there but i left but i left for personal reason personal reasons and i regret now because look how far ahead i could have been oh well it's never too late yeah of course it's never too late for sure so um yeah there's not really a lot going on in this episode so it's just basically more mayhem with phil and lil you know them swinging around into the the rope with the hook in it and you know knocking down the the baby pyramid and phil and lil not acting at all they're just like sitting there which of course i mean what do you expect you just expect you know phil and lil to just immediately start acting when you put them on camera they're probably like not even they're they don't pro- they're not actors they don't even know what they're doing they're just a bunch of babies you know so Unless he can actually really understand what they're actually saying and what they're really like. Yeah, but even then, I think that they don't really have a clue on what's going on. So, yeah, so this episode just plays off in the crazy mayhem that we've seen in the previous episode. So, not really much to say. I I agree with you, ZL, that this episode is pretty decent, although it's not one of my favorites either. It's it's a, it's actually nice to see, you know, Phil and Lil being focused on this episode as opposed to Ch- Tommy, as we've seen in the previous episodes. And also... That's what I loved about Rugrats. It didn't just focus on one, one or specific characters. It focused on every character. Every character got their own story, and it would be an opportunity to help build 
apart from their personalities, it won't make them tick. Yeah, exactly. And, um, I, but yes, but this is once again another episode where they go into crazy mayhem. And, um, I, from what we've seen so far, I think that, you know, waiter, there's a baby in my soup and at the movies are a lot more better in terms of that. So I thought this episode was just okay. Yeah, me too. I think that a lot of season one episodes are decent, but I think, but I think that the, that there are a lot of gems in this season, but, but some of the early season one episodes are just, okay because they're just getting into the groove of things and really introducing us to the characters and their and their well yeah so let's go over to the next episode so episode 4a is called little dude and it was written by ms freeman in this episode dd takes tommy to her workplace a local high school for use of a, as a visual aid in home economics three of her students ask to watch tommy while dd's on her lunch break but when they ask but when they accidentally lose him, he starts wandering around the campus, causing trouble as he does. So, another episode involving with Tommy getting into mayhem. I noticed something. A lot of season one episodes had Tommy had entire episodes devoted to Tommy, just acting like a regular baby instead of well how he acts in the rest of the show's run. There's entire episodes where he doesn't even talk at all, and his actions speak for themselves. Exactly, yeah, for sure. His actions are different than compared to the later seasons, that's for sure. So, yeah, we have, um, you know, Grand- so we have, you know, Tommy, um, you know, being taken over to Dee Dee's high school where we do learn about Dee Dee's occupation. She is a high school teacher. And from what I understand, she is a high school teacher at, um, I forget what the name of the high school was, but apparently it is based off of an actual high school in California. So this is actually one of our first indications that the series on Rugrats does take place in California, which makes a lot of sense because that was where Arlene Klasky and Gabor Chupo lived. That was where, um, you know, Klasky Chupo's uh, company was. So it does make a lot of sense to set it there. And a lot of the veterans that work on the show are from California. Paul's from California as well. Exactly, yeah. A lot of people were living in California. So, yeah, we have Dee Dee taking the, um, you know, t- taking Tommy to, to her high school. And then we have a home ec class where the high school students are looking at the baby for the first time. And Dee Dee teaches them about how to change a dirty diaper. And none of the students are even remotely interested in doing it. Even for extra credits. I can't say I'd actually blame them. Yeah, for sure. And the only one who's interested at all is a student who shows up late, uh, Ramon, otherwise known as Rocco by everybody, who's like this cool James, you know, Dean kind of character uh, who, you know, rides a motorcycle and he has the slick back hair and wears the glasses and he looks really cool. And then he dubs Tommy the little dude. And eventually he gets some plastic surgery to lot like a wallaby and then end up with his own series two years later oh jeez, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you have a point there so yeah so Rocco is uh definitely a highlight for me in terms of a cool character that you would see in like any high school drama in sense of like everybody wants to be like him all the girls want to go out with him and he's just like a chill guy who you know is working at um at his school's uh, garage and you know when he eats lunch and he's accidentally blamed for messing up with a jock's ble- uh, a jock's jersey he kind of stands up for him as opposed to like saying hey man I didn't do anything and then starts the stereotypical food fight it's a great operative of dismantling internal structures of 80s teen dramas like Beverly Hills 90210 and dissecting their cliches and deconstructing them yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Beverly Hills 90210, Saved by the Bell. Um, you know, even like something along the lines of the John Hughes movies like 16 Candles or Breakfast Club. Ironically, speaking of Breakfast Club, there is some kind of connection because guess who sung a song for guess who sung a song for the soundtrack in Breakfast Club? Who's that? E.G. Daly. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people seem to forget that E.G. Daly, you know, did a lot of things, uh, you know, did a lot of movies back in the 80s, uh, you know, uh, and as well as being a singer. 
So, yeah, I think that there's, um, you know, not really much to say. I mean, we have the teenage girls who are wanting to watch over Tommy, but then they're, like, there's this guy who comes along and tries to, like, swoon over um, them, but they're not interested, and so they drop Tommy down. Tommy starts wandering around and causing mayhem like you do. And then we have, you know, Rocco coming by and getting Tommy out of the cafeteria right before the the food fight starts breaking down. And then she gives... Uh, then Tommy um, is, you know, brought back to the girl safely. And then we have Rocco and the other teenage girl looking at each other with, like, loving eyes. And then, um, you know, we have Dee Dee coming along and, you know, asking about how that everything went. And then they actually did something really smart in which they're saying, like, Mrs. Pickles, um, from what we've experienced with Tommy, I don't think we're ready for children yet. So I think that's actually pretty cool that... You know, they thought that raise, you know, looking after a baby was going to be really easy, but then it turned out to be harder than they imagined. I th- I think it really is a classic twist. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, no, no, so overall, I did enjoy this episode. Uh, again, I know it's the stereotypical uh, baby goes through mayhem plot, but. You know, them going to a high school and, you know, doing all the stuff that you see high school students do and having a food fight and getting introduced to, like, cliched characters and their element. I thought that, that, you know, with, um, you know, Tommy kind of, like, you know, subverting that, I thought it was actually pretty neat. Me too. Rocco's a really likable character, and I really wish that the show would have shown him more often instead of being a one-off one time character. Yeah, I thought that I think there should have been like more episodes with Dee Dee going to the high school. I thought that that would actually been really neat to see a different perspective of Dee Dee other than just being like the worried mom. Alright, so let's go over to our next episode. We have episode 5. Uh, 5A is Beauty Contest, which was written by Everett Peck from a story by Arlene Klasky. You may know the name Everett Peck because he was the creator of Duckman. In this episode, having the desire for the Kingfisher 9000, Stu and Grandpa enter Tommy into a beauty contest by placing him in girls' clothes and a wig, naming him Tonya. Their main competitor is Angelica, who complicates the competition. Interesting fact. There's a recess episode with a similar plot and and the same name. I mean, I guess it's not too surprising since, um, you know, uh, Paul and Joe also worked in Rugrats, and I'm sure that they took that same idea and put it into Recess, so it's not too much of a surprise. And is it just me, or is the name Tanya a coincidence to the fact that we had a character, I mean, that we had the figure skater Tanya Harding, who was known as a famous figure skater right before she hired some you know, people to kill off her competition. Do you think that was probably a reference to that? Because I think been... that probably was knowing this show. Yeah, I, I agree as well. That Because that would have been like around the same time, right? Exactly. I think what made the show work was that it was basically the starting point of the type of formula that movies like Toy Story would, in that it was, in that it was able to appeal to kids but also have lots of inside references for the adults to enjoy. I think it was really starting ground for the formula that Pixar movies would lay the would lay the um, clutch on to. Yeah, even Matthew Clipstein said this once. Exactly. So basically, we have Grandpa watching, um, you know, TV as always. But then he sees a commercial about a beauty contest for little girls. And the prize would be the Kingfisher 9000. When he tells Stu this at first, he's like, what? There's no way I'm going to let my son enter a girl's beauty contest. And then when he says, like, but Kingfisher 9000, he's like, I'm in. Given that, I do not think that Stu would react like that if this episode was made today. No, not at all. I think that he would have been a lot more open-minded to it. Yeah, given the given that this was the early nineties, where where cross dressing was frowned upon, basically he didn't exactly have the best reaction. But nowadays it's more accepted, so uh, so I think he would have probably been a lot more open and easygoing about it. Yeah, for sure. 
So, yeah, they, then they decide that they were going to, you know, dress their baby up as Tanya. And then we have the other little girls competing. And then Angelica comes along and says, like, I'm going to compete in this, too. And then, you know, the, then she, like, looks at and, you know, looks at Tommy and saying, like, hey, you look familiar. And, you know, she kind of, like, starts acting like her mean self like she would if she did find out if it was Tommy. Although she was intimidated, what she, what she says is hilarious. And it, it, it is symbolic of why she's integral to the show and why and why her mean uh, demeanor is actually hilarious and gives the sh- gives the show some sort of ins- a lot of incentive to work off of yeah for sure um yeah so we have angelica performing first and she's you know sings my country tis of thee and she sings it like so loudly and she goes over the top and this is the first time in the series that we do actually get to hear angelica sing which will happen later on more in the series i think originally angelica was supposed to sing badly off for comedic purposes there are episodes later on that actually shows that she's actually got a great so you just actually got a great voice when she's not singing off key for comedic purposes. Like, for example, I thought she was great in the episode Vacation. I think that she was great in Regrets in Paris, Regrets Go Wild, uh, several other episodes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Her singing got a lot better as time went on, but here it's just like, ah, ah no way, man. And then we have Tommy's performance, and the only thing he does is, like, he just spins around and looks really cute and... Apparently, that gotten so many points compared to, like, everybody else who actually put talent into it that, oh, a cute baby is, like, enough compensation for it. Just goes to show you that all that time and effort was wasted. Yeah. You know, just when they were about to accept the, uh, you know, the comp- the, um, the, um, the trophy, uh, you know, coincidentally, we have Dee Dee coming along and watching the, you know, the beauty contest because she was invited by Drew to see Angelica perform. And she had no idea that Stu and Lou were actually entering Tommy into the competition. But then when they called out the name Miss Tonya Pickles, that was when Dee Dee was like, uh-huh. what? And she was, like, completely shocked that, you know, her husband and her father-in-law would even do such a thing. And she made, she immediately goes up into the stage, and she pulls off Tommy's wig and revealing, does this look like a Tanya to you? And everybody's, like, really shocked. And so, because of that, Tommy and the rest, and, you know, his, uh, Stu and Lou are disqualified, and the winner ends up being Angelica. I think it's very, very well known that Neither Arlene nor Gabar have, have written most of the episodes, but this was actually the only episode that she kind of co-wrote. Yeah, like, she was the one who came up with the idea. But it was ever Peck that kind of flesh, uh, fleshed it out. Does this can does this um, count as a kind of writing credit? I, well, she was the one who came up with the story, but it was Everett who came up with the actual, like, final product so it is a, it is in a way that arlene does get credit for how this episode came out to be because she was the one who came up with the idea but it was a repress that kind of clean it kind of cleaned and um flushed it out exactly but yeah arlene klasky wouldn't get as much um creative freedom to talk about the, the earlier seasons of Rugrats since it was all Paul Germain who did it. So overall, this episode I did I did enjoy as well. I, I actually did like the, the different perspective of a beauty contest and um, the fact that, you know, Stu and Lou were able to do anything so that they can be able to, you know, get a fishing boat for that matter. And I did like that, um, you know, Angelica was able to like sing over the top uh, Lee and ended up winning in the end. So, yeah, I do enjoy this episode. Me too. Alright, so next episode we have is Baseball, and it was written by M.S. Freeman, the same person who wrote Little Dude. In this episode, using tickets, Grandpa won in a radio contest. Stu and Grandpa take Tommy to the Grizzlies baseball game, where they play the Boston Bombers. Tommy, however, is more interested in catching his balloon than the bowl game. As the episode progresses, Tommy's balloon hunt eventually makes a spectacular catch for Grizzly players Bucky Majors. So, yeah, this episode, I do think it's okay as well. Um, It's actually, you know, pretty nice to, you know, change things up a bit. But we have, again, another Tommy-centric episode where he's going through mayhem. I remember Paul 
stop those after the first season because he was getting tired of them and they th- he thought they were getting monotonous. And yeah, repetitive. exactly. Even I'm starting to get a little tired as, you know, we've reached episode 5B of the same premise over and over and over again. And this episode is pretty decent. I, I mean, I'm a huge baseball fan. I, you know, my dad, you know, you know, took me to baseball games as a kid and I have grown up with it. And, you know, experiencing, like, being in a baseball stadium and watching your favorite players go up into bat and catching balls and stuff like that, it does bring a lot of fond memories to me. Um, And, you know, seeing this perspective where, you know, Tommy's trying to catch something with, um, you know, his balloon flying away. And, um, you know, we get to see the perspectiveness of everything going on in baseball, like the lady playing the organs and, um, you know... People, pl- you know, throw, uh, you know, the the guys throwing the peanuts at the um, the um, at the customers, and you know, the baseball players and all that kind of stuff. So, it's actually, you know, really nice for that baseball perspective. But I think that compared to the other episodes in the series, I think that it's um, it's okay. It's not it's not one of my favorites personally. I think that what made the episode great is that most of the humor comes from situations that could feasibly happen in real life like like um the panic of Tommy going missing and wreaking havoc and causing mischief is is what parents really really go really have to go through because sometimes their kids go missing and then they cause then they cause trouble behind the behind their backs and watching characters do uh, have to go through those struggles on screen makes it all the more relatable yeah, um, so, oh, uh, yeah, I don't really have a lot to say about this episode personally. I just think that it's a pretty decent episode about baseball. If I do wanted to, if I wanted to see a Nicktoon that had baseball in it, I would mu- much rather watch Hey Arnold's episode on baseball. But, no, I mean, like I said, I think it's actually pretty decent. Um, it's definitely not going to be, like, one of my favorites, though. I know, I know what you mean. I mean, like, it's a decent episode, but it's not one of my top ten let's just let's just say I'm not saying it's bad. I don't think that I don't think any of the episodes are bad but it are bad in the first season per se. But I just think that this one is just okay. Okay. That's fair enough. Alright, now we go over to episode six. We have um, episode 6A called Ruthless Tommy. It premiered on uh, October 6, 1991, and it was written by Ron Birnbach. In this episode, being mistaken for the son of millionaire Ronald Thump Tommy is kidnapped by some thugs named Bob and Mike. The thieves soon find that kidnapping Tommy is more trouble than they thought it would be. So yeah, this episode is actually pretty (laughs) funny, but at the same time, it's actually pretty terrifying to know that, you know, the fact that Tommy was able to just walk out of the door pretty freely with Grandpa Lou falling asleep, and that they, you know, they were, you know, Tommy was being kidnapped by a bunch of thugs, thinking that that's Ronald Thump's son, even though that clearly it is not. (laughs) And soon, and soon that millionaire who who son that they think think it is would would be president of well well Kowalski Chupo you know Kowalski Chupo land I guess yeah sure in the in the world of Kowalski Chupo Ronald Thump is our president and oh boy and the son would probably go off and just say a bunch of dumb things who i don't know but yeah so we have these two thugs who want to steal ronald thump's baby for a bunch of money and they assume that um tommy is the son until they kidnap him and they don't have any idea what to do but um we have tommy constantly crying and there's this running joke about like trying to cheer tommy up with a banana because apparently babies love bananas or something ironically i think Paulus uh, basically used banana peels uh, as a metaphor a lot in his interview, so I think it probably might be incidentally a reference to that. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. And then Mayhem just pretty much just go out of control when they bring Tommy into their apartment, and it's a mess. Like, everything is, like, all dirty and disgusting, and I'm actually curious about, like, how much money were they thinking about getting Tommy if they actually did end up winning the ransom? Like... First of all, I don't think that, um, you know, they would probably have a decent escape plan if the cops were ever to come by. And secondly, uh, they have a bunch of jewelry, and that would probably be sufficient enough for a decent amount of money. So that just makes you question about, like, if they really thought this plan through. Sufficiently when, 
I was when I was analyzing this episode and watching it over and over again. I noticed that that the that the criminals kind of remind me of Harry and Marv, and I wonder if it's that if this episode was written around the time that Home Alone came about. Hmm, that's actually a really good point. I'm actually curious about that. I'm, I'm going to double check and see. I mean, it came out. It, it, this episode came out. 1991. Yeah, this episode came out in um, 1991, and Home Alone came out in 1990. So, yeah. So, that would have been, like, a few months um, of, you know, differentiation between the movie and the TV episode. So, yeah. Uh, You're probably right. There there is a bit of a difference. um, uh, uh, There is a bit of a similarity with, um, you know, these two thugs and with Harry and Marv from Home Alone. Even one of the burglars sounds exactly like Joe Pesci. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Even though that at this point in time with Joe Pesci's career with movies such as um, Goodfellas, I think that him being like the stereotypical, you know, gangster mafia dude it was actually pretty sufficient at that point. And, and it would be referenced later on in Animaniacs with the Goodfeathers. I think it, I think that he was referenced a lot in Nine's Cartoon. Mm-hmm, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, um, again, we just have another episode with Tommy causing a whole bunch of mayhem. You know, him flushing the the jewels in the toilet and turning on the vacuum cleaner and sucking everything up and the 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 bull you know the thugs just going completely out of control the one that i was like really shocked when i saw was when you know tommy was right by the window and bob and mike jump after him and they fall out of the window it's like first of all how i mean how many floors do they live in and how do they survive Oh, oh my God! I have no idea. I have no idea. In in the universe of Rugrats, anything and everything will go. Yeah, like that's that was like crazy to me. That's like probably my favorite moment in that episode. Just like them falling out of a window and then running back up immediately, and then they're like, "We can't deal with this kid anymore. He's just nothing but trouble." And so then we have uh, Stu coming back and, you know, he's asking about Tommy. And then you have the thugs coming by giving Tim Tommy back and saying, like, you know, we're very sorry. Here's your baby back, Mr. Thump. And then they just leave. It's like, Tom- Stu didn't even say anything. It's like, I, if I would have been given my baby back after, you know, by seeing a bunch of thugs, I would have been like, who are you? Why do you have my baby? Should I even call the police? Uh, the bag was a very, very, very incompetent. Yeah, they're not even good at what they do. Yeah, and then it comes back full circle with Dee Dee bringing in a toy banana, and Tommy starts crying, disproving the message of that babies love bananas because they don't. Tommy is not like any other baby, though. Yeah, he's special. He's very special. Yeah, so overall, um, I think that very similar to uh, Slumber Party, it kind of starts off a little bit slow, but then when, they bo- when the thugs go over to the apartment, that's when mayhem started going off, and that's when the episode actually started getting a little bit entertaining. So I thought that that was like, decent enough to give it like a pretty decent, uh, th- to pre- a, a pretty good recommendation. <laughs> I think it's actually one of the best episodes of the, of the season thus far. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's go over to our next episode. We have Moose Country, written by Jeffrey Townsend. Uh, Jeffrey Townsend, who also wrote Slumber Party. In this episode, after hearing Grandpa's mythical story about a moose, the baby go look for one in the backyard. So, um, the previous episodes we've had Tommy, uh, Chucky, and Phil and Lil and the gang just like going outside of their boundaries. They went over to, um, you know, to the movie theater. They went over to the restaurant. They went over to the baby commercial, the beauty contest, the baseball field, and now we're just going back to the backyard for a very simple episode about adventuring and this is the first time that we've had it in a while i think that the first time since um barbecue stories with a basic plot about you know the babies looking around in their backyard which would play a lot in this in the later seasons i love the colors in this one they're so vibrant abstract and colorful that they really give the show a sense of direction and um gives it a very 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 unique look and honestly i think this episode best shows off the right strengths and their abilities to really uh, dig into their yeah. neurosis 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we essentially have, you know, Grandpa Lou telling a story about a moose. And he shows a picture of a moose that he apparently captured many years ago. And then the babies are, like, really interested in finding a moose themselves. They decided that, you know, beyond their backyard is moose country. And Chucky tries to explain to them that there is no such thing as moose country. It doesn't even, uh, it's not in their backyard. But then Tommy says, I'm going to prove you wrong, Chucky. Moose country does exist in our backyard. And so they just go wandering around. And the very, one of the most important things about this episode is that it introduces us to you know, the babies eating worms. This is the very first time in the series in which they do that, thinking that it's chocolate spaghetti. It shows us the baby's curiosity in a very, very gross yet funny way. Yeah, it, it, for sure. And, um, you know, Tommy is actually the very first one who eats a worm, believe it or not. Uh, T- Chucky does attempt to eat it, but he, he spits it out. And we don't see Phil and Lil eat it, which is ironic because out of all the characters in the series, Phil and Lil would be the one who eats the most worms. I think in the first season, they were just getting into the... They were just digging into the nuts and bolts of what made their personalities tick. And I think originally some traits went to... It originated from other characters and then would be carried over to other characters later on. They become synonymous with it. Again, we understand that this is the first season so that, um, you know, characters' uh, personalities haven't been, like, fully um, tweaked yet to be more familiar, but um, it is interesting to mention that. So they keep on looking around, and then we see Spike um, jumping into a pile of uh, leaves and branches, and he ends up getting uh, branches that look like moose horns, and they think that Spike is a moose. And they go after Spike, and then eventually they see up close that it's not a moose, it's actually Spike. And so then they figure that, you know, there is no moose country, and then they decided to just go back. And then it turns out that Grandpa's story was kind of like a little bit of a hoax, because then we see the the picture that he shows Stu, and it turns out to be an insurance calendar, not an actual picture of Grandpa Lou capturing a moose. And this would kind of like be one of the first ch- uh, cases in which when Grandpa Lou would be telling his stories and they're kind of a little bit far-fetched. I think that the episode itself is a perfect taste of what the series would eventually shape itself up to actually be. I mean, I actually think this is probably the episode where the show grows a bit and really, really, really stretches itself out and- Um, So overall, um, I did enjoy this episode as well. I thought it was um, actually, you know, I thought it was actually pretty interesting to see a different perspective of, you know, the simple backyard, you know, with moose country. Um, I think that maybe the, the location was a little bit limited compared to other episodes, but... They did. They were able to pull it off in a pretty re, uh, unique and creative way. And uh, I even know some people who actually still remember this episode. I think it's one of the most memorable episodes of not just the first season, but I think it's the, one of the most episode, memorable episodes of the show period. I think a lot of people quote this episode and talk about this episode to this day. It's one of the fan favorites. All right, then let's go over to our next episode. Uh, episode 7 premiered on November 17th, 1991, and we have episode 7A, which is called Grandpa's Teeth. And, this, and it was written by Ben Hurden and Margot Pipkin. In this episode, at a picnic, Grandpa is warned to keep his dentures in his mouth. However, he removes them regardless, and Spike steals his teeth while he's busy with the food. Tommy and Chucky try to get the teeth back because the war veterans are having a concert at the picnic, and Grandpa needs his teeth in order to play the trumpet properly. Now, this, I believe, is one of the many episodes of the series that is actually referenced in a video game called Rugrats, um, The Search for Reptar for the PlayStation. We actually do get to play a level with Tommy and Chucky trying to grab Grandpa's teeth, and they have to chase after a goose. Fun fact, Margaret Pipkin is actually one of the staff members from the earlier seasons that would later stay on, that would later stay on for the Fresh Revival run. And Ben Hedden is one of the writers for the pilot. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah, we have essentially like uh, Klasky Chupa veterans working on this episode. 
Um, so yeah, the episode basically you know, focuses on Grandpa Lou, and he is a trumpeter playing for um, a veteran's concert at a picnic. And he wants to take off his teeth because he wants to try Dee Dee's mashed potatoes and there's some jello. And, um, you know, then he's being warned to not take off the teeth because every time that he does, he ends up losing them. Then he decides to go behind their backs and he does take off his teeth while eating the mashed potatoes. And then, you know, we have Spike going after them while he's, you know, taking a bite off of a, you know, bunch of ribs. And then, you know, Tommy and Chucky, they noticed that, you know, Spike had taken the teeth and Chucky was like, you know, maybe your grandpa will get some more teeth. And then we have one of those speeches that Tommy would be given. I think this is the first one that, one of the first ones that he's done, actually, where he talks about like, you know, who's done this for me? Grandpa. Who lets me stay up late? Grandpa. We have to do it for Grandpa. And this would, you know, later happen throughout the rest of the series where Tommy would give like, motivational speeches. It would later become a regular hallmark, and I think this is probably why I myself give sim- similar speeches because I have it ingrained in my brain. That- um, and yeah, I, I, and then of course, you know, we have um, you know Tommy and Chucky wandering around in this park, and the the teeth get stolen by a goose, and then the goose is actually pretty scary looking because geese don't have teeth, but when you look at a goose, when you look at any bird that has teeth on it, especially with a realistic bird, it looks pretty terrifying, especially if it's one that's attacking you. Exactly, and I think that what the show, as I said before, perfectly exaggerates is that is how is how the babies view things and how and how huge and how terrifying they are and they really 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 presents what they see in the same horror shot type examination that the babies you know but then we have that ending where it's like the rush to give grandpa's teeth back right before you know, he starts playing. And at first, you know, it doesn't go very well. He's just, like, blowing and he can't properly play the Star Spangled Banner. And so then, finally, we have, um, you know, t- you know the-, the teeth flying into the air in slow motion. And then, you know, Lou sees it and then he grabs it right before it falls to the ground. And he, you know, dips it in water so he can get it properly clean. And then he's able to play it. And everybody's, like, cheering for his perpor- performance. And, you know, Tommy and Chucky... You know, like, we're, like, almost, like, shocked and traumatized in a way of what just happened. And then Tommy's like, hey, let me, Chucky, let me see your teeth. And then he's like, oh, no, I'm not going to let you do that. Which we'll get to, like, teeth um, well, much later on in the series. So, yeah, uh, overall, this episode was actually really enjoyable. I did enjoy the fact that, you know, we had a bit of a focus with Grandpa Lou and also, you know, Tommy and Chucky going through, like, a an adventure uh, instead of, like, mayhem because it wasn't mayhem that they caused. It was somebody else and they were trying to fix everything and them having to go through, like, a huge adventure so that they can be able to get teeth back from a goose. I thought that, you know, I, I actually really enjoyed this one. The animation and the colors in this episode seem very abstruse and it really, really stood out. Hmm, yeah, I, I guess it makes a lot of sense compared to in Moose Country in which everything was, like, really colorful. I guess they wanted to kind of, like, contrast that. I, I actually loved how they ex- um, experimented with uh, tinkering with the desi- tinkering with the designs in this episode, giving them really, really, really um, weird shapes and uh, funny expressions and really creative proportion. I actually think it's one of the best uh, versions of how Tommy and Chucky were drawn in this, they were drawn in this high series. All right, so let's go over to our next episode. So uh, the next episode in episode seven is Mama Trauma, and it was written by Steve Vixton and Joyce Oliver here. Um, when Tommy draws on the walls, Dee Dee insists on taking him to a therapist. While there, he sneaks away and goes on an adventure around the office building while Stu is being psychoanalyzed. So, yes, once again, we have another episode where Tommy wanders around and goes through a bunch of mayhem. But the one thing that personally stands out for me is that something that we haven't seen since episode one, which is Stu talking about Drew in a very dramatic and emotional way. I think it's pretty well established that, that Stu and Drew always had a, a sibling rivalry dating back to childhood. Yeah, for sure. So I think that Tommy drawing on the walls and Dee Dee overreacting by taking him to a therapist is a little bit offhandly overreacting because, you know, he's a baby and it's not because he's going through some emotional trauma or trying to get attention. He's just a baby. He's That's what they do, you know? 
I think basically from what Paul has said that the riders were actually satirizing how Psycho Bubble was huge in the 90s and a lot of parents pretty much worried about how they were raising their children and looked and looked to child psychologists to solve the problems. Yeah, yeah. And we did discuss about that in the first episode of, you know, Tommy's birthday uh, with, um, you know, Dee Dee being obsessed with Dr. Lipschitz and trying to make the birthday party uh, absolutely perfect. So, yeah, we so basically with, you know, Stu talking about Drew and saying a whole bunch of really sad stories about how Drew used to do a lot of things to him as a kid and it made him really upset. And, you know, just we have Tommy just you know, going around and he's messing up with a whole bunch of things. He gets like a a painting like really dirty with um, this woman who's like being caricatured into this painting. And then he, you know, does like, um, he squirts enough paint to make like a mustache and a goatee. And then we have um, Tommy being involved in like some sort of, um, you know, uh, a group, um, you know, like a group uh, discussion about how to make a decent toy. And then there's like this really stagnant robot. The only thing that's good about it is the ball. And all the children just wanted to play the ball as opposed to the robot. And then we have, um, you know, just Tommy, uh, you know, going over to the uh, the floor cleaner and uh, accidentally like pushing the button to like let in all of the uh the wires and then the guy just like is being scrambled over thinking it was a ghost or something going after him so yeah it's typical rugrats fair where tommy's causing something and things just go wrong i think it's actually funny how uh they originally they initially went in to discuss what is causing tommy's behavior to just do telling his life sorry to the psych- to the psychiatrist. Yeah, I'm actually more invested in, you know, Stu's discussion as opposed to what Tommy is going through. I think that's the point. As you get older, you get more invested in what the adults are doing rather than the babies. Yeah. Either that or both. Yeah, for sure. And then, uh, and then, then Dee Dee decides that maybe, you know, a therapist isn't a good idea when, you know, she is given the bill of what, like a, over like a few hundred dollars. And then he's like, I don't know, maybe therapy is not such a good idea, especially with the fact that he was just mostly sleeping throughout the whole thing and he didn't even pay attention whatsoever. Uh, still got all of his frustrations out and he, and, that psychologist wasn't even listening to it. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, overall, I do think that this episode is pretty decent. Uh, it's definitely not one of my favorites, but I did really enjoy some of the things on it, like especially with you know Stu's, uh, you know B- Stu's drama and you know Tommy going through his usual wacky shenanigans. So I thought it was pretty decent. Me too. I think it, I think from this point forward i think that the episodes just get better and better and better and the writers keep utilizing the skills yeah yeah to to the extreme yeah for sure and speaking of like better episodes we're about to cover one right now episode eight which premiered on december 1st 1991 and we're discussing about a classic episode real or robots written by steve vixen and joan sullivan here after seeing a Frankenstein-type horror flick, Tommy and Chucky want to see whether Stu is a human or a robot. Stu, however, has having a reoccurring sleepwalking dream in which he is the host of a cooking show. This is the first of um, many that shows that Stu is a nervous wreck. Yeah. But that's actually what makes him funny. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Stu has been up, you know, constantly working on a whole bunch of toys because he needs to make sure that they're ready for Mr. Muckle Honey. And he hasn't been getting enough sleep lately. And so, um, you know, he done, you know, goes to sleep early. And then we have Tommy and Chucky watching a movie about like, a, you know, a scientist fixing up a Frankenstein like robot and they're wondering about if Stu is a robot because he's been acting weird. And then they do a whole bunch of tests by going back and forth and back and forth with, um, you know, Tommy and Chucky finding out if, um, you know, Stu is actually a robot. Probably one that really stuck out to me personally was when, you know, they were, uh, they grabbed some um, pliers and they were hoping to, like, twist Stu's nipple, like, if it was, like, bolts to see if his chest would open. I was actually talking about this with, um, I, I, I don't remember if it was Paul or Joe. I think it was Joe. And then they were like, "Are you?" And then Joe was like conf- concerned if they, if they, they actually could do that. And Gabor was like, "Sure, why 
why not? That's fine. <laughs> and then they actually were able to pull it off. So, uh, and then, you know, the sleepwalking scene is also a really memorable moment as well, where, you know, Stu is at the kitchen and he's pretending to be a, 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 a host of a cooking show and he's grabbing a whole bunch of eggs and he's just throwing everything all over the place. And Tommy and Chucky are like, he's like acting really weird. He's probably like talking to a whole bunch of robots or aliens or something like that. Most of the pros of this episode come from Stu's obscenity and, um, Overall, wacky shenanigans that really, 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 really drive on point that this episode is a, an ultimate classic. Tommy and Chucky discover that, hey, you know, Stu is not a robot, but then Chucky's like, but what about my dad? And then we have, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> then we have thunder and rain falling over, and then they're, like, looking beyond the house, thinking about, like, if that's going to be the case. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's, you know, that, that Spongebob episode where Spongebob thought that Mr. Krabs was a robot. I wouldn't be surprised if they got their inspirations for doing that from this episode. Me neither. You know, it's ironic. I'm not saying that Spongebob is, was ripping, is ripping off Redress in, in any way, because I don't think that's the intention. But I think it's ironic that Spongebob would later kind of succeed Redress as, like, the, the Nicktoon, and yet they they have a lot of similar plot devices, but I think that, but I think that a lot of Nicktoons have similar plots to each other. I, I don't think this is a coincidence. No, it's not at all. So yeah, overall, I really enjoyed this episode. It's actually one of my favorite episodes from season one, and um, I thought that it was really funny. You know, the curiosity of Tommy and Chucky thinking if Stu was a robot, Stu, you know, going completely in, insane with his sleepwalking, and. I thought that, um, you know, the mayhem that, um, you know, Tommy and Chucky go through to prove their point is actually pretty hilarious. And it's actually really sweet in the end when Stu thinks that um, he was having a dream where Tommy was actually trying to prove if he was a robot or not. And then it kind of like sweetly says, no, that's not true because your son loves you very much. So I thought that that was a really sweet ending. But um, yeah, let's go over to our next episode. So we have um, episode 8A called Special Delivery, and it was written by Patrick Ver- Verone and Maya Williams. Patrick Verone is a very well-known writer. He's known for writing uh, episodes of The Critic, Futurama, uh, The Muppet Show, and a whole bunch and The Simpsons. I know a lot about Rugrats, and then even I didn't know that. I mean, like, what kind of fan am I? <laughs> That's okay. And then we have Maya Williams, who was very well known for writing a lot of episodes of The Simpsons. Uh, no, not The Simpsons. Uh, Futurama, uh, The Wayne's Brothers, Mad TV, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, etc. So we have them writing this episode, Special Delivery. And here we have Stu ordering a doll from his competitor, Egbert Toys, called Tina Trousers. And Dee Dee tells Tommy the doll is his baby sister arriving in the mail believing this tommy sneaks with the mailman to post to the post office causing trouble as he does so again we have another episode where tommy causes a lot of mayhem except this time it's in a post office i actually think this is the most interesting rate habit episode simply because of the dangers and um scary situations tommy gets himself into oh yeah I mean, for like, sure. how how on earth is he still alive after after all those near-death experiences. Oh, especially that scene that actually freaked me out as a kid where, you know, that huge drop where there's, like, a whole bunch of, like, rejected letters and and packages. There's a skeleton down there as well. I know! That, I know there is a skeleton down there. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, Tommy was able to pull himself out of it, going into a chute where he was able to land in safety. But, yeah, it, that is, like, that is definitely one of the most dangerous places that Tommy has been in, for sure. It amazes you how he's still, still here in one piece after after all of that. But that's the magic of cartoons, like yeah, yeah exactly. Cartoon logic—you can go into a dangerous place without even getting a scratch. But, yeah, I think that, um, for the most part, I don't think that the plot really matters in this episode. Like, I didn't really get too invested of, you know, Stu purchasing a doll so that he can find out what the competition is. The one thing that really just got me hooked was Tommy's attempt of survival in a post office with, you know, being tossed around in different chutes and different um, conveyor belts and all that stuff, being grabbed and being x-rayed, like a baby being x-rayed in that age, I don't think that would be very healthy due to radiation. So yeah, that's the only thing that I really remember about this episode, just with all the crazy stuff that Tommy goes through in the post office. (laughs) I think that I think that the twist at the end is really, really funny. And you don't know what's ironic in hindsight. What Tommy here seems enthusiastic about getting a brother or sister, but 
And to the movie, he actually does. Well, here's the thing. Like, in the beginning of the movie, at least he was excited about getting a baby sister. But then he would eventually get a brother instead. So may- maybe Tommy was actually more open of getting a sister than a brother. Probably. Yeah, it would actually make you think about, you know, a what-if scenario about what if Tommy would have gotten a sister as opposed to a brother. Instead of baby Dill, we would have gotten a baby Trixie. Probably, and the, the Tina Charles episode is... It's a perfect simulation of how that would be, even though the, the doll isn't even set in it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so, yeah, no, nothing much to say, so let's go over to the next episode. We have episode nine, and it, it premiered on January 5th, 1992. We have uh, Candy Bar Creep Show. It is a Halloween. I'm sort of surprised that, that it debuted in January instead of October. I take it that maybe production issues were going on because um, from what I've uh, interviewed with a bunch of people like storyboard artists and, um, you know, directors and stuff who worked on Ginger, it usually takes about a year to produce a cartoon. So I take it that they maybe they attempted to try to release it, but maybe they were running out of time. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. So it's still better, still better with deadlines than certain other cartoonists. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, uh, so we have Candy, but nonetheless, even though that this episode did come out a few months late after Halloween, um, it is still a very memorable episode, especially with the introduction of the Reptar Bar. So this episode was written by Tom Abrams and David Howard, and in this episode, the Pickles set up a haunted house for the neighborhood children of Halloween. As treats, they pass out Reptar Bars, which contains chocolate and nuts and caramel and green stuff and swirls and twirls and, okay, I'm done. The Rugrats go to the haunted house to search for them, eventually scaring Angelica and Grandpa as well. And, you know, we have another memorable um, bit of merchandise with Rugrats in the form of the Reptar Bar. Holy crap, you made you me hungry for a Reptar Bar now. <laughs> I'm surviving. I, 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 wanna, I do actually do want a Reptar Bar. I know they do sell them in um, FBE Entertainment. Uh, no, FYE Entertainment, I'm sorry. I tried them and oh my god, they are uh, some of the best candy that you'll ever, ever taste in I'm your entire life. I'm hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but let's continue. So, yeah, right. we do have, um, you know, everybody, won- we have we have the babies wondering about what's going on. They're setting up the jack-o'-lanterns. They're putting up decorations. Dee Dee's dressed up as a robot. We have Stu dressed up as a Frankenstein monster, which is a nice callback because, you know, the, in, the, in the previous episode, we thought that Stu was a robot, and, you know, now we have him as a Frankenstein monster. How ironic. Um, yeah, they're setting up for Halloween, and they're wondering about what's going on, and then we have Angelica coming by, and she introduces Halloween as like the time where you get a whole bunch of candy especially with reptar bars and the you know one of the things that really made me like wanted a reptar bar when I was a kid was that it made your tongue turn green and I thought that that was like the coolest thing in the world (laughs) me too I always desired even as a kid to get my tongue green and little did I know as an adult that dream would come true I've still got I've actually got photos of my of, of where I've had my tongue green from Buying one single reptile bar. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, there's. I mean, there's not really much into this story, but the main focus is them trying to get a reptile bar. Uh, I think that the atmosphere really does come into the second half when they do go into the haunted house, and they do, um, you know, look at all of the skeletons and the the creepy um, de- decorations, and then they look at all the stuff that they have uh, set up, like the um, spaghetti worms and the olive eyeballs, and then Tommy, you know gets um caught up in a sheet where he you know uh, appears to be a ghost and then when the kids go inside and then they're like scared out of their minds and then grandpa lou goes in and he sees the exact same things that angelica saw and then he starts getting scared out of his mind and then it goes into the point in which when Stu and drew are fighting on to who gets to go see um the haunted house first because they're scared to go see it themselves once again what they intend uh, what they intend for the babies to do Ends up happening. Ends up happening to them. And the one thing that I do appreciate is that you know, it's if, if you were a kid yourself, I, it it does have like a nice bit of a scare to it, but it's not too scary into the point at which it gives you nightmares. Exactly, Mundo. In fact, I was actually I, I thought the funny scene is where was is where Grandpa Lou actually ended up being ended up being scared by the haunted house himself. Despite insisting that as a kid he, despite insisting as a kid that he was pretty, pretty much 
unfazed by by anything that's scared him. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think overall, I think that this is one of the best episodes of Rugrats, not only from the first season, but also just in general. I think that, you know, we have the first introduction of Reptar Bars. Uh, It's the very first Halloween episode, which we will kind of get a little bit later on down the line. And also it does build up this really nice, creepy atmosphere when they reach over to the haunted house. So I do really enjoy this episode a lot. It's definitely one of my favorites. Same. All right, so now we go over to episode 9B, which is called Monster in the Garage. And it was written by Peter Gaffney, who would later on co-create All Real Monsters with Gabor Chupo. A mouse is loose in the pickles garage and house knocking things off of the shelves. And Stu is put, puts the blame onto Spike. The Rugrats then Peter Gaffney up- actually wasn't, uh, wasn't involved with All Real Monsters creatively. He was just involved in the developing process, according to an interview. Yeah, but his name is still in the credits as one of the creators. True. Um, anyway, so continuing on, a mouse. Is, uh, so the uh, so in this pl- in this episode, a mouse is loose in the pickles garage and house, knocking things off of the shelves. And Stu plays, places the blame on Spike. The Rugrats set out to prove Spike's innocence after hearing Boris's story about a hero fighting the Dybbuk with his clobbermeister. The Rugrats go into the garage in search of the monster. So we have another episode that is kind of like trying to be. Somewhat of a scary episode, very similar to the Halloween episode in which it does play into the atmosphere of something creepy coming along in a place that you think that you wouldn't want to go into. In that episode, in the previous episode's case, it was the haunted house, but in this case, we have the garage. This was actually featured in the Rugrats VHS that I actually, that my school. I would actually watch it every time I had the every time you we were allowed to watch VHSs and. Instantly, I was really hooked on it. I actually thought that it had a lot of strong points, and the premise was actually ve- was actually meticulously well written. I actually think that the that it me- that the way that the that their fantasies were animated made made their made the goals just as exciting as it seemed to them. I think that it actually really, really, really drove the audience drove the audience. So, so that we were just as captivated by what was going on, and we wanted to see what would happen as much as the babies did. And I think that, for, I think that for a show with the pri- with the premise that it does, I think that I think that the the fact that it was able that it's able to do that, making it appeal to all audiences, is amazing. Yeah, for sure. And I think that what really builds up the atmosphere just as much as in the. Halloween episode was when Grandpa Boris does tell the babies the story about the Dybbuk. Now, for those who are wondering, what is a Dybbuk? A Dybbuk is a Jew, is a monster from Jewish mythology that is a possessed spirit, being the dislocated soul of a dead person. So it's essentially like almost like a ghost that wanders around a bit. So. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, Grand- so Grandpa Boris is telling this story about how the hero fought the Dybbuk with a clobbermeister, which is basically a way of, you know, thwarting a Dybbuk, especially since it is an evil spirit. Um, so then they think that a Dybbuk is actually haunting the garage, and so they get their own clobbermeisters to fight off against the monster that is in the garage. And then when they look further into it, I, I really do like the buildup of when they go into the garage the first time, being really dark and, um, you know, all the shadows being played around, especially when we do get to see the shadow up close for the first time, and then it turns out to be a little mouse. And then... They actually decide to not run away in fear, but they actually decide to um, show the mouse that they've come in peace and they want to be friends with it because they're, the mouse is more scared of the babies and the babies are scared of the mouse. I actually think this is the, the first episode that we got to see how Chucky would later turn out to be in the series because here he's timid, he's afraid, he's reticent. He's really reluctant to go along go along with the plan, with what Tommy planned and that's how his character would end up being in the majority of the series, the bulk of the series. I th- and, you know, the fact that the babies are not scared of the mouse, but Stu is when he sees it and he calls Spike for help to get rid of it. It's a funny twist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is very funny. 
And then he shows his appreciation by saying that he's going to let Spike sleep on their bed from now on and that he's going to treat him better. And um, that, you know, the babies do kind of feel proud that they were able to prove Spike's innocence and they were able to defeat the monster. So I thought that that was really cute. Me too. That sounds adorable. Yeah. Overall, I did really enjoy this episode, and it was kind of like a nice compliment to the Halloween episode because both of them do have like similar premises with monsters and going into some place that is kind of scary. I think it was a nice part. I think it was a it was a great episode that that supported and carried the, um, carried over from uh, Candy by Creepshow. Monster, Monsters in a Garage is one of my favorite episodes that doesn't that doesn't have Angelica in because that. Because to be honest, a lot of my favorite, a lot of my favorite episodes are very, very are Angelica centric because Angelica is my favorite character in the entire show. I think that also another thing that really makes it special is that um, with uh, you know Tommy, you know it, it's very similar to how uh, you know Tommy felt about you know you know helping Grandpa receiving his teeth from the goose. It's kind of like how he was really determined to help Spike out because Spike did so much for him. So, again, it's showing off Tommy's, you know, determination to, you know, help the ones that he loves, which I really do love and appreciate. Yeah, so our next episode is episode 10, which premiered on February 16th, 1992. We have Weaning Tommy, written by Anne Hamilton. In this episode, on advice from Dr. Homer, D Tommy's dentist, Stu and Dee Dee take Dommy's bottles away from him and try to coax him into drinking from a cup. Tommy, however, wants to stick with his bottle. So we essentially have an episode where we see that Tommy really loves his bottle. He has a strong passion for drinking out of it. He has different places where he keeps bottles and he gets from it. And then one day, you know, he goes over to the dentist and he sees, and the, you know, Dr. Homer sees that Tommy does have, in fact, one tooth. And then he thinks it's about time that he gets properly weaned. Which, by the way, if you're wondering, uh, you know, that is when you are, that is at the point in your life in which you are removed from drinking a bottle or, you know, in some cases, you know, drinking milk, you know, breast milk, um, that you are removed from that and you are, you know, learning how to drink from a cup just like you would a normal person. It is said that if you do drink from a bottle or breast milk from, you know, the natural place, then your teeth actually do tend to, you know, fall over and it tends to kind of misshapen just like it's shown in the chart that Dr. Homer was showing, which is actually true. It is it is possible to wean a baby as young as a year old, or at least it should be, at, uh, or the most, it should be at least about maybe a year and a half or two. But... I do agree, you know, from Stu and Dee Dee that even though that Tommy does have one tooth, it is still pretty young for him. Maybe like a couple of teeth I can see them stewing, but not at this age. It is very congenerate because parents and babies have difficulty with weaning. Basically, parents really, really battle with trying to wean the, with trying to wean their kid because it's very hard on them and it's a big change. And well, the babies don't like it because. It's different what, from what they from what they used to, and they prefer the bottle. But uh, over time, they get used to it. However, Tommy, our Tommy, doesn't. No, our he Tommy doesn't. Bites. No, he doesn't get used to it. At, at least at first. Later on in the series, we would see him drinking from a cup, but not at this point in time. But so we have Tommy incredibly miserable. Uh, with you know the you know the parents trying to in, you know, introduce cups to Tommy and he's just like tossing them aside and he's not remotely interested in drinking from them and they're wondering about what they're going to do and you know th that Tommy has to you know eventually grow out of the bottles and then Tommy starts crying and then we get another like really trippy dream with Tommy you know being confronted by the 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 cup saying drink me it it makes you think it it makes you what kind of acid the production team was on while they made this episode because I definitely felt like it was I felt like I'd smoke I'd smoke a joint while fast watching it yeah and then we and then eventually you know there's this giant bottle who goes over to Tommy and then squirts the cup away and then Tommy's like I, I can't drink from you I'm too big for bottles and then he's like oh but I'm a big people's bottle I'll take care of you and I was like uh big people's bottle I was like thinking about beer bottles and I was like oh no 
<laughs> but I, I guess like maybe water bottles or some, or maybe juice bottles will probably be more sufficient in that way. But yeah, just a grown ups bottle. It just got me thinking about other things. But anyway, but yeah, the the parents eventually find out that maybe Tommy is too young to be drinking from a cup, and so. Um, we actually do have this really sweet moment where they sneak into Tommy's room to try to give him a bottle and all of them are holding it even though that they promised themselves that they weren't going to. And then when they see Tommy sleeping, we have Grandpa Lou actually sneaking a bottle into his pillow and Tommy's like really excited to be drinking from it again. So I thought that that was really sweet. That's a very touching ending. Uh, Rugrats really excelled in giving its stories a really heartfelt and heartwarming conclusion yeah all right so we go over to the next episode of these uh of this ep uh, episode 10 it's called aisle incident in aisle seven which was written by lou greenstein uh, uh lou greenstein and larry lobdell and this one is, is another um episode that would be referenced in rugrat search for reptar and it's another infamous one because we have an introduction of another brand of reptar which is reptar, reptar cereal. cereal yes uh, yeah, so in this episode, Grandpa takes Tommy to the supermarket where Tommy makes a huge mess while looking for the new Reptar cereal. So, I feel that the animation got a lot more edged out in this episode. Like, it felt a lot more polished and it would be it would be an indicator of how the show would eventually turn out the luck. Yeah, it does, look, it, does, it does look a lot more put together, I do agree. So we have, um, you know, Grandpa Lou having, like, his favorite snack bar, and he's completely out of it. And so he wants to get some, he's asking Stu to get some more, and then he's like, you know, you can't be eating from those, uh, you, because, you know, you go through them so much. And then he says, you know, that they need to get a whole bunch of groceries and such. And so Grandpa's like, okay, I'm going to take, the, I'm going to grab the groceries and then I'll grab my favorite, you know, snack bars or whatever. And then he takes Tommy along with him. And, you know, once again, we have another situation where Tommy causes wacky shenanigans. But this time we have it in a supermarket. And for the first time in a while, we have Larry and Steve back. I actually felt like they were some of the best aspects of the earlier seasons. I feel like you could actually make a whole show devoted to their off-the-wall, crazy misadventures. I think they'd get into legal trouble over that because of the names of the characters. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that, you know, around that time, uh, like a few years later, Larry and Steve would be the name of a pilot, and that would later turn out to be for Family Guy. And also, maybe they probably couldn't have a spin-off series off of them because maybe they would have compared it to Beavis and Butthead. Probably, and they'd probably be accused of um, catching in on its popularity, even though that they came first. Yeah, exactly. They were the ones who came first. So, yeah, again, we have just Tommy wanting to get some Reptar cereal, and, you know, he's just causing a lot of mayhem, knocking all the baby supplies off of the shelves, getting uh, knocking down watermelons that is crashing into lobsters and soda cans and all that stuff. Everything is just, like, a complete mess. We have Grandpa Lou, who's, like, in the corner trying to calculate everything about, like how much of the bars that he needs to get so that he can be able to match the budget within the grocery list that Stu and Dee gave him. And um, then eventually, you know, uh, we have, uh, you know, Tommy getting the Reptar cereal and then, you know, they decided to buy it as opposed to like some brand puffs that Stu and Dee Dee prefer to get instead. Because, you know, we are uh, later on in the series, we will know about Dee Dee's uh, obsession of trying to stay healthy. And so, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, there's not really much in terms of plot in this one. It's just more wacky shenanigans. So, yeah, it, it's one of the most memorable episodes of Rugrats, not only because of the wacky shenanigans, but also because of the introduction of Reptar Serial. I think what held this episode together was definitely Tommy's um, blunders and misfortunes and, and uh, mishaps. I think those are what made the episode truly truly uh indelible all right so let's go over to episode 11 and this premiered on march 29th 1992 and we have touchdown tommy written by tom abrams and david howard while Dee Dee and betty go out shopping Stu and the guys babysit the rugrats while watching the ultra bowl 37 on tv later grandpa gives tommy a bottle of chocolate milk Angelica, who normally thinks that she's too old for baby bottle, fights Tommy over it, which sends the Rugrats into their own football game over the bottle. Which, this is another episode that is referenced in Rugrats Search for Reptar as a mini game. 
So, yeah, this is another very famous episode in Rugrats, not only because it's football themed and, you know, it's Super Bowl themed, but also because we have another mayhem that just goes into, like, a huge mess. I actually thought that the quest to capture Tommy's milk was far, far more entertaining, more entertaining than the adults arguing over the game in this instance. And by extension, it's much, much more entertaining than any of the Super Bowls have been during the last few years. So, so it starts off with um, Dee Dee and Betty asking Stu, um, you know, seeing Stu had, um, was interested in watching the Super Bowl, and then she's afraid that, you know, that, you know, they're, they're going to make a huge mess in the living room, and that they're going to, um, um, you know, cause a whole bunch of mayhem, and that it, you know she's not, uh, you know she's not, um, she's not um, convinced that you know they can watch the babies while they go out shopping. And then Stu makes a sincere promise that you know that you know he'll watch over the babies and that they can just worry about going out shopping. But it turns out to be a huge lie, because then we have you know Chaz bringing in this huge widescreen TV and then we have Howard and Grandpa Lou coming on by and they're watching a huge game of the Houston Oilers versus the Dallas Cowboys which actually is known as the Governor's Cup which is basically that um, you know the Houston Oilers which are now known as the Tennessee Titans they used to have this huge rivalry against each other about like which one was the best team in Texas and during that time um, you know, when they were, you know, doing that episode, it had been, um, from what I understand, the Oilers, uh, you know, had just started winning a lot of their games. And so it was awesome to see, like, you know, the, the cheering and all that stuff. And in 1991, which I believe that's when that episode was being written at the time, it was one of the most infamous games that ever happened between these two rivals because that was when they went into overtime and then eventually the Oilers did win. So they were essentially making a reference to that because, as mentioned earlier, it takes about a year of production to do these episodes. And that was probably what was in their mind at the time because it would have been around um, November of 1991 and this episode comes out in February. For a show on Nickelodeon at the time, Rugrats had a lot of inside jokes and references that only adults would uh, adults would get for the most part, which I think is one of the reasons why it's held up so well and why it's remained so relevant over the years. Yeah. Because it has a lot of pop culture references and um, little nods to events that happen during, that happen during the time that the audience, not the tar- that the six to eleven target demo that Nickelodeon and the show at didn't really grasp at the time, but then much later on they find out about it and then they hear the references and they say, "Oh, I got that." Yeah, for sure. This is definitely another case in which we have the babies and the adults' perspectives like really intriguing and interesting. We have the adults cheering on for the football game, and then we have an amazing scene and choreography and an animation where the babies are kind of like reliving what's going on in the football game while they're trying to grab the chocolate milk. It's definitely one of my favorite moments in the entire um, episode where you know we have Angelica wanting to grab the chocolate milk and then Tommy, Chucky, Phil, and Lil are fighting against her and it's playing off very similar to the football game that's going on right now while at the same time making a gigantic mess and I thought that that was like really nice in in tune with what's going on in the episode it makes everything just come together so well I I really thought it was hilarious that babies trying to grab Tommy's chocolate milk really synced well with with the game that the parents were watching uh, so yeah, not much to say, but other than this is definitely one of my favorite episodes of the series. It's it's hilarious, it's memorable, it's it fits so well with everything. The kids and adults' point of views are really fascinating. I I really do enjoy this episode a lot. Uh, just as much as I enjoy the next episode, which we're going to be talking about. It's called The Trial, which was written by Paul Germain. In this episode... Himself. Yeah, Paul Germain himself. In this episode, someone broke Mr. Fluffles, Tommy's clown lamp, and Angelica wants to find out who, so the Rugrats hold a mock trial. The trial ends up revealing that Angelica was the one who broke the lamp, and she ends up in the high chair as a punishment. This is definitely one of the best episodes of the series, and a great indication on Paul Germain's direction of treating the babies much more seriously as opposed to being childish. A little well-known fact that people don't really know about is the genesis of this episode was that it was supposed to be a satire on the Rashomon movie 
Oh, uh, yes, that's right, for sure. Uh, Rashomon is, I can definitely see the influences on that. Yeah, this episode was actually very interesting, but it was also very controversial. Yeah, I can understand it being controversial. It was even controversial for Arling herself because she felt that the baby, she felt that, you know, it was being too pushed away from her original idea of, you know, the f episode being focused on baby adventures. She felt it was just too grown up for an episode like this to even exist. But I'm glad it does. I'm glad that it pushes that boundary of what um, a show like this could actually be about. I've got, I've got, I've got something to tell you. Fun fact. You know, in the 2016 interview, guess what Arlene Klasky said? Let me guess. She likes the episode? Yeah, it's actually a favorite episode now. Ugh. This is the exact same what thing that she felt about Angelica. She said that she hated the character of Angelica, and then all of a sudden she said, oh, Angelica's my favorite character, so I'm not surprised that she said that. As for the episode itself, I actually think that it might actually be my favorite of the first season in general. Oh, I yeah. mean, it really pushes the boundaries and limits of what a show, of what show like this, as you've said, could really do. And uh, shows that it's more than just a show about talking babies, that it can really, really exceed the intelligence of what kids shows were uh, intelligent, really exceed the intelligence type of writing that kids shows were able to do back then i think i well, actually really really did start kickstart the type of writing that other shows in its wake would be able to do yeah i really did enjoy this episode as well it had a lot of suspense it had mystery in it it had a lot of drama it wasn't like really trying to be like funny it was essentially trying to be like if it was treated very seriously as a mystery crime drama something that you would see in something like law and order but played into the baby's perspective and and what is interesting is that it could have been you know at first when um you know angelica was being the persecutor she was like saying a whole bunch of like legit you know reasons on why she thinks that each of the babies did it whether it's you know phil and lil when they were playing ring around the rosie and they accidentally knocked over the lamp and then we have chucky who was afraid of clown this is actually the very first time in which we actually know about Chucky's fear of clowns. And then we have, you know, uh, Angelica, who's claiming that she's taking a nap. And Tommy was busy with his mom, so he couldn't have done it. So, you know, with Angelica being the one responsible for it, it's not too much as a surprise, considering that we did know of what kind of character she was. But the buildup was actually really interesting. And for a while, you know, before, that, before the reveal, I thought that it would have been Chucky who would have done it because he was afraid of clowns. Me too, and I think that the episode is set up to make you think that until we get to the juicy parts of the end. It oh yeah, not the chair, not the chair. <laughs> and you know something, Angelica was a, a most calculating, worst, mean, and um, overall unchained, and I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> it was great, by the way. So overall, um, yeah, this episode is wonderful. I really love it. And I think that you're right, uh, uh, ZL. This may be the best episode of season one. It's, it's one of the best. Oh, it's one of the best Angelica episodes, definitely, because it really, because it, because she's so over the top with how, with how, with how evil she comes across in this episode. They actually genuinely end up loving her instead of hating her. And I think that's a large part of her, part of her, the appeal of her character, even though I don't think she's evil in general, you do understand why she acts the way she does in season two, and I think season two is where it really, where it really digs into that. Yeah. But here, she re here she shows no mercy at all. <laughs> For sure. All right, so now we go over to episode twelve, which aired on April twelfth, nineteen ninety two. We have. Uh, uh, the first one we're going to be talking about is Angelica versus Spike. No, wait, I'm sorry, v Fluffy versus Spike. So we have Fluffy versus Spike, written by Steve Vixton and Joe and Sala Bahir. In this episode, Angelica brings Fluffy, her pet cat, to Tommy's house. Fluffy ends up making a mess of things, but Angelica blames Fluffy's crimes on Spike, so the Rugrats attempt to prove him innocent, which is a very similar premise to Monster in the Garage, in which Spike was being blamed for something that he didn't do. But in this case, we are introduced to Angelica's pet cat, Fluffy, and we have Angelica being her usual mean self. Uh, this... This episode is for the ages. I think that from this point on, Rugrats actually improves within its, within itself with each episode and shows off what it's cap really capable of. 
Yeah, and I thought it was really funny with that scene in which when Angelica was dancing to Ride of the Valkyries, where she said that she was taking like some sort of ballet class, um, which is actually re interesting because then there will be a reference to ballet much later on in the series with um, with Susie, but we'll get to that much later on. But yeah, I mean, what ballet class would teach Ride of the Valkyries with Angelica wearing like this huge Viking horn and then just like grunting and just going up and down with her movements? Even in season one, she had a great, she had a great fashion sense. I think that she would innovate most of the styles that people try to emulate now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and as for Fluffy, you know how the old saying goes that eventually your pet kind of looks like the owner. It pretty much is like a dead on point with Fluffy because she looks exactly like Angelica with the. She's pigtail. a spinning image of her. Yeah, she's a spinning image of her with the pigtails and the mean attitude. Yeah, she's a. Brand kitty, brand, brand Miss Kitty, brand. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, the the plot um, with you know uh, Angelica is great. Even though that I felt that you know they were rehashing a plot from a previous episode, which you know is to be expected because we have a cat and a dog, and you know cats and dogs are known for being like enemies towards each other, which is fine. But I think that the Angelica moments are probably my Unless favorite. Cat dog. Ugh, right, and, and like cat dog, unless it's cat dog. But uh, yeah, the Angelica moments are probably my favorite things. About or Ren this and episode. Stimpy. Or, or Ren and Stimpy, yes. But the Angelica moments are my favorite things about this episode. Me too. I think that she does genuinely made the show. I mean, there are other sh there are other elements of the show I like, but I think that Angelica really steals the show, and I really think that she, even though the main character is Tommy, she is the real star of the show. I think that lots of the I think most of the best episodes and the most interesting come from her because I think that she's actually the character with the most wired and fleshed out and fully, fully intact personal personality of all of the characters, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. Overall, it's a pretty decent episode. It's not one of my favorites, but Angelica is the one that makes it for me. So now we go over to episode 12A, which is called Reptar's Revenge, and it was written by Peter Gaffney. In this episode, the Rugrats go looking for Reptar at the Slizola uh, Brothers Fair. This Reptar, however, is a serial addict by the name of Leo. And I have to say that when it comes to, like, you know, Reptar introductions in season one, this is probably my least favorite because it's not really that special. We had the amazing Reptar movie, we had the Reptar bars, we had the Reptar cereal, and those were, like, great. But here, it's just kind of a ho hum and just nothing out of the ordinary. It's just some guy who's just like addicted to cereal, and you know the Rugrats characters are just going after him. And it's a shame too because it's in a theme park. This theme park would have been—it's like this really cheap theme park. And um, I thought that this would have been like really cool and a big opportunity to cause like some really crazy shenanigans. But it's nothing out of the ordinary. I think what sticks out for me in terms of the episode is how trippy and weird and crazy everything looks yeah it does i look, think I, it actually, does. I love that i love that type of animation style and it's been an influence into my own artwork yeah, the the one thing that I do really remember from this episode was when, you know, the the guy in the reptar costume gets out of the water during the tunnel of love scene and then he scares every he scares Sue and Dee Dee while they're trying to have like this really romantic uh, moment. I thought that that was hilarious. I actually thought that a lot of the funny scenes and a lot of the most uh memorable actually did come from Angelica. I think that she really did carry the plot. And it's an example of as to why she is really important to the show. And I, in my opinion, I think this is exactly why she was the breakout character. I mean, Tommy might be the main character, but I think that Angelica has a stronger personality and more to her than Tommy does. Probably because she is an antagonist slash anti-hero. I mean, but Tommy is supposed to be the protagonist and supposed to be like, even though he's not supposed to be perfect, he does have flaws like everybody's human but you got what i mean yeah yeah so overall i thought that this episode was okay there were some moments that i really did like but overall i thought it was just middle of the road i thought it was decent but not amazing same here all right so now we go over to our final episode of season one. We're going to go to episode 13, which premiered on May 24th, 1992. And we're starting off with another classic episode, Graham Canyon, written by Craig Bartlett. 
In this episode, the Pickles experience car trouble en route to the Grand Canyon. Eddie and Ace, a couple of crooked auto mechanics working at the Twin Cactus Auto Repair, try to make a simple cheap thing more expensive. But Angelica and Tommy inadvertently stop them from further damage while playing in a canyon of tires. I think this is the def definitive Craig Bartley episode because uh, a lot of his... <laughs> A lot of his trademark humor comes in a lot of scenes, and a lot of the artwork is definitely reminiscent of what he'd actually draw, except in the classic YouTube art style than his own. I think that a lot of his humor really shines through. Like, my favorite scene is when Angelica tells Cynthia to stop being cranky, stop being cranky, and she needs an app. So take it out! Yeah, believe it or not, Craig was the one who designed Cynthia. He was the one who created her. I think that when you look at Helga, you can kind of tell. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does feel like proto-Helga. So basically, his typical art, we're going classic YouTube post art style. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, we have um, Stu and Dee Dee wanting to go to the Grand Canyon, and they take Tommy and Angelica along with them. And uh, then we have, you know, the scene in which when, you know, Angelica decides to grab the map and use it as a coloring book, and she just colors the lines, and that's how Stu and Dee Dee got completely lost, and then they end up in you know nearby the auto repair because it's in the middle of nowhere and they can't get any business so they decide to put a hole there on purpose so that any time that a person uh, that, that a group of people get lost they would charge more money than ordinarily and that they would be able to um you know take advantage of the fact that we have uh these um you know this this group of uh you know people trying to go over and you know to their trip and so we have you know these guys trying to dupe them out the style of this episode is all correct by all of his uh, all of his hallmarks are definitely filled uh, filled throughout the episode and Angelica really shows here that she went from being like she went from being like this bully antagonist to being basically a toddler version of a mix of Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and I think that's a that's a lot of why I love her character she feels like she feels like a toddler version of Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck um, makes things at one and believe it or not, we actually have an uh, appearance of uh, Pat Buttram as one of the mechanics. Pat Buttram, who is a very well-known actor and comedian, you may know him from a lot of like, you know, TV shows and comedy sketches. And uh, this one, this probably would have been one of his last performances too, because his last one was a quick cameo in a Goofy movie where he was um, the guy who uh, was announcing Lester's um, Possum Park, and that would have been around like '94. Or 95. This was one of his last roles right before he passed on. And then we that, have that's an amazing that's an amazing movie to go to go out on. But I'm still but still really really sad that he's that he passed away. He was a really great talent and one of the best actors in the business. Yeah, yeah. I remember in an episode of Talking Tunes with Rob Paulson where um, Bill Farmer, who's the voice of Goofy, was talking about you know his um, experience with meeting up with him, and um, and then he was like saying that he was running like some sort of comedy skit uh, skit over. To him that he was going to say to somebody else and probably one of the most famous things was like you know he was talking to some guy and he said that you know uh you know you're a, uh, you know uh you're a strong guy and uh, I, I don't i forget who was who he uh, pat, pat was saying this to but he was complimenting him at first saying you're a strong guy you can do one arm push-ups you know um uh, father time treated you well but you're so ugly because uh you're so ugly that mother nature kicked the shit out of you in your face and so he was really well known for saying a whole bunch of jokes that were kind of like fearless and kind of like complimentary but insulting at the same time, which is kind of like a, a, a calling to him. But uh, yeah, uh, so going into the episode, I'm sorry. So uh, meanwhile, with, um, you know, Tommy and Angelica, you know, are wanting to know about, you know, how, how you know, when are they going to get to the Grand Canyon? And then, you know, Stu and Dee Dee are you know getting something to eat at the diner that is close by for convenience so uh you know Didi gets uh pie spilled on her by the waitress because she has like rickety hands and um uh, we have Stu looking at the menu trying to figure out what he wants to eat and then we have Tommy and Angelica going over to the garage thinking that that is the the the, the 
Tower of Tires is the Grand Canyon. And then so they start climbing around and they knock out everything and it, it disrupts the mechanics. And they think that everything is, that the car is haunted, which is kind of reminding me of, of um, you know, of... Um, Mama trauma in which the guy who was doing the uh, the vacuum cleaner and the it was attacking him thinking that it was ghosts so it, it kind of like brings back a a reference in a sense so they decided to fix the car for free they gave him a fresh uh, air freshener they led them to the right direction of the Grand Canyon and then they decided to go over to this water park slash hotel called the Clam Canyon where they had all you can eat clams and you know Tommy was like oh this place is nice but I had more fun in the Grand Canyon which they never went to and I thought that was really cute i actually like a lot of the episodes that feature tommy and angelica doing things because it actually shows a different side to their relationship like they're kind of like brother and sister yeah yeah for sure i actually did like uh tommy angelica's uh interactions in this episode for sure definitely uh, in my opinion a lot more than something like slumber party but yeah let's go over to our last episode in episode 13 which is called stew makers elves written by steve vixen and joe and Sullivan here in this episode stew receives an order from muckle honey industries for fifteen thousand patty pan stalls however he's having trouble with the machine but tommy and chucky accidentally fix it when fetching the zippo glider with chucky uh, accidentally th tossing it in to the basement so we have another reference to muckle honey which was mentioned in waiter there's a baby in my soup and there's the patty pan stalls which is actually the competition doll for tina trousers from egbert toys from special delivery so it does tie in some continuity into the episode that's why i noticed about Rugrats. a lot of earlier seasons would pay would pay references to earlier episodes and show that they chemically happened like, for example, uh, in these episodes in Jock is in Luck, Dean mentions that Tommy broke out daycare once, and, which was a reference to the big house, and then Tommy says, well, it didn't really work for anything. Yeah, and then Dean tells him, it's not the things you do, it's the things you think. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll talk Toxic. about that episode much later on. So for this one, um, we have Stu trying to create a machine that can make a whole bunch of patty pan stalls. And he's trying to make sure that everything is ready right before Muckle Honey Industries is demanding the, the amount of toys that they need. Which, again, you know, this is something that we hadn't really seen too much in the later seasons because we assume that he no longer works for Muckle Honey, that he works on his own. And so, you know, we have him trying to build a machine to make the toys a lot faster and uh, we have Drew essentially making fun of him saying that you know uh, of the toys when you know we have the arms by where the ear should be and the feet where the like in the wrong position so the machine is like a disaster and so we have Tommy and Chucky going down the basement because Ch Chucky accidentally threw his glider, uh, glider plane into the basement and so um, in the previous episode we had the babies going into the garage and now we have another place where babies uh, or even people in general kind of tend to fear when going down to, and that would be the basement. I think the scene where Chucky remembers his birth was the funniest because of how much of hyperbole and how exaggerated it was. Like, he always imagines the worst kind of situation and scenario possible. I think the funniest moment in this episode was when Chucky gets trapped into the mattress. I remember when I first saw that episode as a kid, I bursted out laughing so loud and so hard. I couldn't stop laughing for like five minutes. Me too. I think that's pretty much what made the episode so funny. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, Chucky bouncing into the mattress, saying like it's fun, and then all of a sudden, the mattress just goes into a complete whack, and then he's trapped into it. It's like, it's so funny, and then he's thinking like, everybody's gonna call him Mattress Boy. And then finally, you know, he gets freed, and then they fix the machine, which it turns out that the machine was in reverse as opposed to forward, which, that was like pretty dumb that Stu didn't figure that out much sooner, but whatever. So the machine works fine, and then they were able to distribute the, the dolls in time, and um, Tommy and Chucky almost like traumatized of their experience in the basement, and they, they got the plane in the end, but then eventually, you know, they throw the plane, and then it ends up back in the basement again, and they have to go back, and then more wacky shenanigans will ensue. I think it was a perfect way to end off the inaugural season of the series, and basically give us a little appetizer of what was to come. Wrong. Yeah. So yeah, that is every episode of Rugrats season one. So overall, um, I think that 
in, in general, I do think that the episode does uh, the the season, in my opinion, does start off in a bit of a rough patch throughout the beginning. But I think that the writing does become a little bit more better as, like, towards the middle of the season. I do admit that there are some episodes that feel kind of samey with Tommy and Chucky going through a wacky shenanigan with whatever their place at. But this would get fixed in season two when the writers, uh, you know, even agree that that was starting to get old really quickly. And, um, you know, we get introduced to the characters. We get a lot of introductions to things that would become iconic throughout the series. And overall, um, even though it does have its rough path, I do really enjoy this season. Me too, and to be frank, I actually think that the that the season actually gets off to an um, awkward start is because the writers were trying to figure out who the characters were and uh, what the show was going to be. But I think that the I think that the the show finds its legs and its niche later on and becomes much more refined. And that's actually impressive for a show's first season because generally, first season of a series of any type of series is usually the weakest because the writers don't know what the show's gonna be about and what direction they're gonna be in. But I think that season one had a had a grasp of that really, 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 really well. Yeah. So I'd like to know from you, uh, ZL, what have been what what would you say are your top five episodes of this season? Oh the trial, Graham Canyon, uh Tommy's first birthday Fluffy vs. Spike, uh, Candy Bar Creep Show. Yeah, those are pretty good choices. My choices for my favorite episodes of season one are um, Tommy's First Birthday, At the Movies, Real or Robots, the, um, the Trial, and Touchdown Tommy. Graham Canyon was really, really close to being on the list, though, but I'll, I'll give that as an honorable mention. Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah, um, that is it for this podcast. So yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to looking back on season two, which will definitely take a long time because it has double the episodes, but we will try to give it out as soon as we can. In the meantime, a baby's got to do what a baby's got to do. <laughs> All right. See you then, everybody.